Hello everyone, this is criminal profiler Pat Brown and today we're going into the very interesting case of who did in Susan Walsh. Now Susan Walsh, she was a, a woman who lived in New Jersey and she was called a stripper uh, as her vocation along with journalism, an interesting duo. And then she went missing one day and she's never been found. And there's so many theories about this case it's ridiculous. And there are way too many, <laughs> um, uh, way too many documentaries done about this case and all of them conflict with each other. So I'm going to get into what you should pay attention to and what you shouldn't uh, because I went, I watched them all and I've been, it's been a very exhausting, um, uh, Friday and Saturday. So this is Sunday. So <laughs> I've made it so far. First, I want to welcome everybody who is in the chat room. I said hello to almost everybody who's here. Yes, I think I've said, oh, CJ has now arrived too. Uh, and if you're later now, too bad. I can't say hello because people get bored and they disappear from my show really quick. But if you'd like to be in the chat room and be part of the community, uh, please do join Patreon. Link is below in the description. It's five bucks a month, eight shows. There are four case files, so one every um, what case shows, one every uh, weekend. And also I have uh, hangouts every week. So there's eight shows to come to live. And then you can participate in the community and in the chat room. And if you don't want to do that, you don't have to, please just subscribe to the channel. Every one of my videos is public for the purposes of education. I don't want to hide things from people have... No, secret videos for only my favorite people. Although you, if you're in my chat room, you're my favorite people, but you're here. And that's the that's the bonus for five bucks a month. Uh, so subscribe to the channel. Please do like the video, check my playlist and go to the search engine at uh, YouTube and put in profiler Pat Brown in any case you're interested in and see if I've done it. I have a lot of cases. I think I'm up to 600 videos now. Believe me, I've probably done yours, but if I haven't, you can always email me, profilerpatbrown at e uh, gmail.com. But if you're a patron, you might get your request in first. Other ways to support the channel, buy my book. This is only the truth, $2.99. It's a wonderful psychological mystery. It's linked below, and you can always hit the dollar sign. Okay, that's that. Let's get to the story. Because, oh, mm -mm. all right. Did you get all that in my, my three seconds? Anne Marie is here too. Hi, Anne Marie. Okay. First, I want to tell you about where you can get information because I, for all of my patrons, I sent them things they could watch before the show. Because as I always say, I may tell stories that help people understand things, but I do not do storytelling. In other words, this is not a channel where I just tell the story. And then, you know, I'm, an, I'm a criminal profiler. I analyze the issues in the stories. And so I always recommend sometimes people go someplace else if they want to do no preparation for, for this. So, what preparation could you do? All right, let's take a take take a look. And hey, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see what I have on the list here. Okay, I have this one. Uh, trace evidence. Uh, he does a a very comprehensive, very clear. Uh, he puts through all the facts, and I've always liked the way he does stuff. Um, He's one of the few YouTube channels I do recommend for if you want to hear what happened, this is one of the guys to do it. Um, so he did this. I recommend that just if you go to YouTube, you want something free, go to YouTube. And he, I think, is one of the best um, YouTube channels for telling information about a case. And he really does spend a lot of time doing it. Now, I do believe he missed the most recent documentary because that kind of, and that's not his fault. I didn't know it existed either. And then I'm like, what the heck? This is all contradictory. Okay, what else can you see? All right, you can go to, also on YouTube, uh, link, I'll link everything below, Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. You can see a very short video about this case. And that, that's cool. Then you can see this. Oh my God. Um, this is Paramount Plus, never seen again. This is the most recent one, 2022. This is why I don't do documentaries. <laughs> anymore hardly ever because i don't trust the people who make them the stuff they have in there is so questionable and i'll get into why it's questionable and why they're just pushing some new theory um they did get access i think it was a FOIA request to get access to the files on on this case from way back when which 
you know, okay, they managed to do it, which I am quite frankly, quite surprised at. Um, let me tell you just before I keep going, let me just tell you, because some of you are like, who is this woman? <laughs> and I forgot to tell you. All right. This is Susan Walsh. Uh, and she attended William Patterson University, where she studied English and writing. And while there, she was employed as a journalist for the university newspaper. I don't know what employed means. I didn't know you got employed in college. I thought you just volunteered, but what do I know? Um, Walsh uh, worked intermittently during college as an erotic dancer and stripper to help pay her tuition. You know, um, I hear this all the time that that's how tuition, you know, what the people are like, why, why, why am I an escort? Because I'm paying for college. All right, that's your story. I'm, I'm, not denying it. Anyway, um, uh, not, notwithstanding her struggles with substance abuse and alcoholism, she graduated from college with a bachelor's degree in 1988 and then worked as a writer for engineering and business publications. We see this alluded to like, like one time. I don't know how much. This is where it gets very frustrating. If you want facts and somebody says, oh, she worked and she wrote these articles. How many? Was it enough? to make her a journalist or was it like she got too accepted? I know from early days of wanting to be a writer, my God, you, let's see, when was this all going on? Okay, she was born in 1960. So she got a bachelor's degree in 1988. She, so she's a little, a little younger than me. All right, but I wanted to be a writer and I wrote short stories and I would, what you do back then, they told you, and you stupidly believed it, that you have, you used to type, you know, on a typewriter, it was a real pain in the butt. Then you put, you put the story in an envelope and you'd mail it to whatever magazine you wanted to be in and hope that they would accept. And if you, if you gave them a folded manila envelope inside, you might get, with, with stamps, you might get your stuff back. Otherwise it just was thrown away. And you would send, and they told you you could not send your stuff to more than one publication at a time. And sometimes it took three to six months for them to decide if they wanted your story or not. So they were like basically holding you hostage for all this time. And you couldn't have like an auction, like, hey, if five publications want my crap, why can't I get the one that's best? No, no. They they had this clever little methodology, which later on I realized you should just ignore. But I didn't and the beginning and I set things out and, and you just, you know, it's depressing. You just send stuff out and you don't get any response. You don't get any response. You're going broke. You're not making money. And you're lucky if you get anything. One day I sold a short story to humor magazine and um, they sent me a hundred dollar check and I was so thrilled, <laughs> but that's how hard it is. And uh, by the way, I think that was the end of my publishing experience back in the day. Now I've published books since then as a profiler um, and as a, as a fiction author as well. But back in the day, I, I just had this, you know, young person's idea that I would be an author maybe. And um, this is what she was doing. So she was like, oh, I'm going I'm to go into journalism. Well, this is a sucky career. You know, chances of you getting anywhere in journalism is very, very limited. You send your stuff out. You're lucky if you get paid $25, $50, unless you're hired to work for a specific organization. I don't see that in her, this, this whole bunch of claims that she, what, uh, worked as a writer for engineering and business publications. And here's what bothers me. When you go to these documentaries, if you're trying to understand how things went wrong for, for Susan Walsh, you should have facts. They don't have any. They just, they make, they allude, they allude to some, oh, you know, she, 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 um, she wrote for a publication. And what? <laughs> How many times? One time? Ten times? A hundred times? Was she, was she? I'm going to say she was a failed journalist. In other words, she wished she would be a journalist. Then it says she was later employed as a writer for Screw Magazine. What does that mean? <laughs> Screw Magazine is, um, I won't get into what Screw Magazine is. Not, not, not your most pleasant publication. But, A, employed as what like if she's turned in something and might give her ten dollars this is this is see this whole case is about misperceptions and i'm going to show you a, how this is so true and how people don't want to tell the truth and i'm going to tell the truth here 
Okay, so then it says, uh, she, in 1984, she married Mark Walsh, a brother of musician Joe Walsh from, uh, I forgot the, the, was it the Eagles? I don't know, I wasn't a rock person. Uh, Eagles? Anyway, she married him. And then she disappeared in 1996 on July 16th. Well, now, this is where everything gets all very, very confusing. Uh, Walsh left her apartment complex in Nutley, New Jersey, Yes, she lived in Nutley, New Jersey, which is just across from New York City, um, which she shared with her with her son. Okay, so here's how it worked. Her strange husband, Mark, because now I say they were strange. Some people say they were except ex. She was an ex, but I don't know. Again, we have no information. A strange husband, Mark, lived below them. So she lived in the upper apartment. Let me let me show you a picture. Do I have a picture of her apartment? Mm, okay, hold on a second. Let me find. I show you where she lived, so that you can at least try to get this in your in your brain, which is is very very painful. I must admit. Um, okay, hold on a second. I gotta find it because I got so much crap from this case. Uh, where? What the heck? <laughs> Y'all know how I have missing pictures. Seriously, did my pictures get missing again? Oh my god! Hold on a second. Hello there. Here we go. <laughs> it's not going to go well. I've been up for hours working on this case. So, so many hours. Okay. This is where she lived with her husband, Mark, but, but not really because now they had separated. They had a son. At that time she disappeared. The son was 11 years old. She, she lived up here uh, with her boyfriend who was a vampire and, and her, and her strange husband lived in the basement. So, and this supposedly worked really well because when she was working as a, as a go-go dancer or whatever stripper or whatever you want to call her, um, she could leave her child either with the vampire boyfriend or with the ex-husband or a strange husband. And so the kid went up and down, you know, uh, so here was apparently where a TV existed in a kitchen, but down here in the basement, I don't know if, wait a minute, maybe they lived on the ground floor and he lived in the basement. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, I think I think they may have been on the ground floor and there's a basement. Poor hu hu ex hubby lived in a basement. He had a he had a bed. I had a bed, and that's about it. And so he would go upstairs wherever the upstairs was to ha to have to to cook, and um, and this is a very weird situation. Let's put it that way. So anyway. It says that um, Walsh had left to run errands and make a telephone call. This is from Wikipedia, and we have this. This is where everything gets very murky. At a payphone across the street, which we don't know where the payphone actually was, leaving her son with Mark, which we also don't know is true. Um, it was the last time Walsh was seen. That is true. Walsh went missing that day. What day? July sixteenth, nineteen ninety six. Theoretically, she went missing somewhere around noon. Although people have claimed they've seen her other places. All right, that's the catch-up for <laughs> the story. Oh, my God. You're going to have to hang in here because one of the things I want to do with this story is help help you understand, again, this is a profiling channel. It's an educational channel. I want you to understand how things really work when you're doing investigating, when you're profiling, when you're <laughs> in the media and, and everything else that goes with it. I'm going to... Just catch my breath here and see if everybody is uh, around, <laughs> if there's anything questionable here. Um, were lap dances a thing in the 80s? Kurtz, that's a good question. I'm not absolutely sure about that. Um, I forgot to look that one up. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm going to talk about the sex industry in general because that's very important. Um, not Oh. Wait, 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 Lila, wait, Lila says lap dances only if they pay and you have to buy them. Yes, you do have to buy the lap dance if you're doing lap dances. And then there's, I, I did go, I will admit this, I went to, <laughs> it, 
when you're doing when you're googling something you have a private area where you can google where they're not going to retain what you googled so i went over to private because i actually did google this i i actually googled if i have a lap dance <laughs> can i have a happy ending <laughs> I didn't use those words. And because I was curious whether lap dancers permitted that or not, and it was interesting because there were a whole bunch of different viewpoints on whether you could have a okay time or a really good time. <laughs> and then what do you do if you're going to have a really good time? I tell you the things you learn profiling people, you know, I know more stuff than most people know and probably should not do. <laughs> It's on the dark web. No, it's just private Google, just so my kids can't find out what the hell I'm, what the hell I'm looking at. Because one day I'll die, and they'll go, "Damn, mom, what the heck?" Oh my god. Okay, let me move forward. With all your wonderful comments. <laughs> this is going to be a very strange case. Okay, so she disappeared, and the question is, why did she disappear? Because uh, there's so many theories because she was a journalist and she, and so I'm going to get into all the different theories about why she disappeared. But first I want to do something that no one has done because no one thinks it's a nice thing to do. <laughs> Sarah, who oh, you're hiding under your wife's name, Sarah, we're not talking about these things. I'll be coming out your way and paying you off. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So I want to put up a picture behind me, which I was going to use as my regular picture for the show, but then I thought everybody's going to hate my guts. So I'll show it to you now. All right. This is Susan Walsh. Now, one of the things you're going to see in all of these shows is they call her a girl. I mean, a they constantly say, oh, she's such a nice girl. Now, mind you, I want to point out this first of all. People are involved in the sex industry. Although no one's saying she's involved in the sex industry. She, just a go, she was just a, quote, stripper slash go-go dancer. She wasn't really a stripper. They're mostly a go-go dancer. But people have titles for these things. Um, there are a lot of nice people involved in the sex industry. Nice. When I say nice, what I mean is, you know, if you met people in the sex industry, they can be sweet. They can be your best friend. They can have your back. Um, they can care. I mean, not everybody in the sex industry, every a, a female that works in sex industry is a psychopath. And not every male who pays for sex is a, okay, I'm going to leave that alone. Anyway, <laughs> I have opinions on that. Okay, so, but women who participate in the sex industry, Yes, they have friends. They have friends who love them, family who loves them, maybe a husband who loves them, boyfriends who love them. They can be loved and they can love. They can be kind and they can be fun and they can all these kind of things. But all these shows that I saw kept downplaying Susan Walsh's participation in the sex industry. Downplayed it calling her a girl, sweet girl. She wanted, apparently she got involved because she in this, the in, uh, dancing, stripping as they call it, although it was really go-go dancing. Um, they got, she got involved to pay her way through college. Then she continued because she wanted to support her son as a single mother, but she wasn't a single mother. She was married and maybe her husband was a total loser because <laughs> I will say this. Remember that place they lived in? Oh, seriously, I'm going to get into the issues of money in this whole case, which nobody wants to talk about. That's a shithole. You are living with your husband, your ex, your husband. He, well, I don't know what floor, I can't quite get the floor straight. She was living with her husband. And then when they broke up, he went down to the basement. <laughs> it's like, it's like, wow, you've been demoted, dude. So now you're down in the basement and she put, brings in her vampire husband. And I say vampire husband only because he, he was in the vampire world. Okay, so so now she's got a new boyfriend. But they're living in the shithole. I do say shithole. Okay, so this is this this is a picture. They're next to a, a, some kind of uh, mall here. 
and, and and this is this is the place they live in. It's not a nice place, okay? And that this this is important. There's nothing wrong with being poorer. Nothing wrong with being a struggling person. But the whole point of her being here is very, very important. Okay? Keep it in mind as I go through this. She's living in what I call a shithole. All right? Um, it's not a nice place. It's, it's, it's a run-down, cheap abode. And this is important. Okay, so anyway, she's supposedly trying to support her son. And the claim is... I don't, you know, say she say she's a single mother. Her, and I, I don't understand it because sometimes during these videos, these documentaries, her husband seems to go be going to work, which is why he needs his ex-wife to show back up and when she's missing. He can't go to work, but then they say he doesn't work. I don't know. I don't know if it, what the truth is here. Um, some say she's she was just supporting him, and he was just what she was trying to support his son, but she was also supporting him in the basement. I just don't know. This is this is. This is, in my opinion, if you're going to do a documentary, for God's sakes, get some facts. But I can't get them because the documentaries are garbage. So, so apparently he's a loser. I, I, I don't know that you are a loser, okay? <laughs> ex, ex or a strange husband of Susan. I'm not saying you're a loser. I'm just saying they're presenting you as a loser. So you're, you're, you're in the basement. Your wife is upstairs sleeping with another dude. And your, your son is running up and down between the two of you who are available when she wants to go to work um, to make money. According to her, she loves her son desperately and she wants to support him. And she can hardly afford to buy him lunch, to, to pr pr have lunch for him to take to school. Okay, I'm having a lot of issues here. And this is what people don't want to talk about. She wants to be a journalist. She does. And she, during her time as a dancer slash whatever else, and I'm going to talk about the whatever else, she hooks up with a guy at the Village Voice. And this is one of the books she's involved in. It's called Red Light, uh, Inside the Sex Industry. Don't pay for it. I got it. Uh, it's, it, it, does, it costs a fortune right now. I managed to get it uh, used. Um, and um, it's basically a very lurid description of all kinds of perversion. But anyway, but there's some interesting things in there as well. And the guy who, the Sylvia Placci, I'm not sure what's her name, she's the photographer. James Ridge, Ridgeway is the guy that worked for the Village Voice who is writing this book and he complains that he cannot find any end to this industry and he wants to write about it. And somebody tells him oh, from, from the other place, oh, look, you should hook up with Susan because, um, man, she she's a... She works in the industry. So he hooks up with her and she's all excited because it's a journalist job, right? Now, she supposedly is a researcher for this book. Do you see her name on this book? Yeah, no. Her name isn't on this book. So you've been hired to do the major research for this book, but your name isn't on it. What the heck? Okay, so I looked in the book to see where her name was. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Our, it's, in the, it's in the preface. Our guide through much of this work was Susan Walsh, who has written about the sex industry for Screw. That's, that, that's the guy who called him and told me, hey, hire Sue. I don't know that he hired Susan. I don't know they paid her a penny because she can't afford lunch for her son. And the village voice. Uh, and also has worked on, on and off as a go-go dancer. On and off. No, pretty much on because she wasn't making any money in journalism. Because she, as far as I know, she did, I can't even, she what, did a couple couple articles for Screw or The Village Voice and that was going to pay her bills? No, that's nonsense. With admirable perseverance and considerable skill, Susan helped us understand the many facets of the industry, gain asset to various places and establish a rapport with sex workers. We are grateful for invaluable contribution to the book. That's what they said about her. They used her. I, I, I'm sorry, James, if her book isn't on, if her name isn't on the outside of your book, I'm going to say you used her, probably paid her nothing or paid her very little. And she was already in the sex industry. So, hey, good deal for you. And she was so excited. You just, whatever she got information for you to help you understand the sex industry, because 
apparently you've never made use of the sex industry. So anyway, th I think she's mentioned one more time in the book where she's talking about her work in the sex industry, but it's like one paragraph again. So this is her life and she lives here in the shithole. So when we're building up to the day she disappears, the question is, what is she involved with? She's, she's now, if you, if you listen to people, what they say about, um, you know, go-go dancers and strippers and all that, they're supposed to be making so freaking much money, but she can't afford better than this. As a matter of fact, the day she goes missing, her phone doesn't work. She can't pay the phone bill. That's why she tries to go down to her strange husband's apartment or room in the basement um, and say, hey, can I borrow your phone? And he's like, hey, you know, who are you calling this time? He had an issue with this. He was like, if you're not calling like legitimate people, I've had people calling my house with fake names and, you know, I'm Mr. 22. Hey, this is not okay. I don't want this crap happening around me and my son. So unless you have a real name for a person, I don't want you using my phone. So supposedly you'd send her out to a pay phone. That'll become an issue later. But the girl doesn't have, oh, the girl, the 36-year-old woman. Let me go back to the picture I preferred to use in the show. No, not, yeah, this one. When she went missing, she was 36 years old. She wasn't a girl. She was a full-blown woman. And my, by the way, not aging really well. And this is very important in the industry. So here she is. She can't afford her own phone. She can't pay the phone bill in her. Now she has a, she has a, um, uh, at that point in time, people didn't have cell phones so much. So, you know, you were using, um, geez, now I forgot what the name of those things were. <laughs> what were those suckers? suckers? Um, okay. Somebody tell me the name of those things. You looked at them. You put them on your belt. <laughs> this is, <laughs> um, I used to own one of those. <laughs> I've lost my mind here. Um, okay, somebody tell me what they are. Come on now. I, this, is, this is where I find out with beepers. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one of those things. <laughs> so what happens is if you don't have a phone, <laughs> pagers, thank you. <laughs> lost my mind. Um, pagers. I had one in the early 1990s because I worked with sign language interpreting for the hospitals. They would page me and then I'd have to call in find out where the job was and go to it. And later on, of course, people just text and say, show up at this place. And it's so much easier. But yes, Patriots, <laughs> sorry, I forgot the term. It's been, what is it, 30 years? Okay, I have a right to forget. Okay, so she had a pager, but she didn't have a freaking phone. So she always had to go to the phone booth. Now I'm going to ask you this question. She's supposed to be making all this money. She's, she's like, She's go-go dancing. And, and by the way, by the go-go dancing, let me try to explain the sex industry a little bit to you. Sex industry has many forms and many, many faces. Go-go dancing. None of those girls can actually dance. Most of them can't, you know, I mean, they don't, they don't have to dance. They just have to do that. <laughs> um, there's massage parlors. The women in the massage parlors can't give massages. Uh, that if you if you're on a real massage, you have to go to a person who actually has the you know actual certificate massage. If you go like massage envy, that's a, that's a, you know they those people actually have ability to do massages. They've been to massage school, and there are people who privately do it who have been to massage school. But if you go to a massage parlor, especially if they're Asian massage parlors, they don't know how to do a damn massage at all. So somebody comes in and goes, "Hey, can you give me a Swedish massage?" You're like, "Sure." <laughs> How about it? anything? You know, they'll just make it up. They'll guess because they know the people coming in there don't really want that. And if they do, what the heck? Are you stupid or what? <laughs> We're 24 hours. <laughs> We're not giving you a real massage. We're giving you a happy ending. And maybe more if you pay for it. So every massage parlor that is not legit is a prostitution front. Go-go dancing. Yes, girls dance, but a lot of them also provide other services and the places know that and prefer it because guys come there and yes people some come there just for their hey i, go, I went to a place and watched the girls dance oh <laughs> i got a lap dance okay okay so you get one guy who just goes out with his buddies and does it but a lot of them want more than that they don't want to pick up a girl off the street so they go to these kind of places that they know they can make friends now 
Here's an interesting thing. I saw one, one, one guy said this, and I'm like, this just amuses the hell out of him. He said this. Susan often dated people that she had, what? Met in a strip club. <laughs> you don't date people you meet in a strip club. You have sex with people you meet in a strip club. You're hooking, all right? You are a hooker. You are a prostitute. That's that's what you're, you're not dating them. Who, who wants to date a creepy dude they meet in a, that, you know, if you work in a strip club or go-go place or wherever, massage parlor, you're not dating the clients because they're creepy dudes, all right? They're guys who want to pay you. You're not going to go, oh, I just want you for my boyfriend. No. If you're dating them, no. Your, your date is a sex date. You're getting paid for that. Susan was involved in prostitution. Straight up. Let's not, let's not play that down. She was involved in working in clubs. Some people said she even did s &M. She was obviously a prostitute. And here's the problem. If you're making this kind of money, where the hell is your money going? You can't afford a better joint than where you're living. But some, pro some prostitutes, they can afford some really fine places if they're in escort services, which are prostitution services, but high end. And you can, they, those, some of those ladies can afford some really nice, nice, nice uh, condos. She couldn't. So, so what's, what's going on here? She can't even afford to pay for a freaking phone. What's going on here is a thing called drugs. She was um, in a rehab for two months. They didn't say what the rehab is for. Um, she claimed uh, right before she went missing, like two weeks before she went missing, she did this show called Stripped. It was a documentary done by one of her friends who was at one point a, also in the business, but had left. And she claimed she had fallen off the wagon. And she said, I've been sober for, I've been, no, 11 years. She didn't say sober, 11 years. I don't believe it for a minute. She was, she was working a tremendous amount. She was often highly depressed. She was sometimes very, very ecstatic. She was trying to do journalism and this. Most people who do all of that are on drugs, usually cocaine, methamphetamine, whatever. They're on something to get through having to do the dancing with these scuzzy dudes and have to sleep with them all. And still, she couldn't buy a damn lunch for her son. That has to be a very high level of drug addiction, in my opinion. And I don't believe 11 years went by that she wasn't involved in it because her son's 11 years old and she can't come forward to lunch for her kid. So we have someone who sadly was heavily involved in the sex industry and couldn't get herself out of the sex industry. It was a really, really rough thing. And so by 36 years old, she was still in the sex industry. And let me let me show you a picture of, um, I saw this in her, the strip thing, and it's, this is just a close up. Um, and, and it's hard to tell right here, but when you see it in video, her skin is terrible. She, she looks older than 36. She's not a good looking 36. That's a rough looking 36. You get rough looking from a rough life and drugs and alcohol. So she was a failed journalist. So all these people say, oh, she was a journalist. No, she was a failed journalist. She never, only journalism she ever did had to do with the sex industry. That's not a real journalist. A real journalist works full time. They do all, they cover all kinds of cases. They do more than just, oh, I can talk about what I do. No, you can get into the journalism with that. I, I'm not I'm saying, hey, that's not a clever method. But if you can't move past that, you're not a journalist. She's 36 years old. She's a failure in journalism. She's a, now becoming a loser in the sex industry because you can't keep going at 36 years old in the sex industry. You start looking unattractive to men who prefer 18-year-olds. You're double the age. Your, your price starts dropping. And that's why some of these women end up on the streets. You're doing drugs and you can't get people to pay you much. And the cl clubs are going, eh, you're looking, you're looking elderly. <laughs> you're not so hot looking anymore. Out. Oh, they, can, they can replace you with young, fresh blood. I would say she was in a crisis situation where she was living with a guy who was was boy friend vampire guy, her ex-husband below or whatever he is. She's trying to raise her kids. She can't pay for anything because she's, she's got 
clear drug addiction problems and nobody wants to talk about it. And she's, and she's failing out of both industries. And two weeks before she went missing, she tells a woman, and by the way, let me show you a couple of people here. Um, she tells a woman she did the show with, um, these are two women you'll see in, in, in more than one documentary. This was her friend, um, Jill Morley. She's the one that did the strip documentary. She supposedly has left. She looks pretty good. Um, maybe she got out in time. And she did this 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 show. And and you have her like two weeks before she goes missing. You have Susan Walsh saying she's she fell off the wagon, whatever wagon that was. Uh, she was highly depressed. Uh, the industry was killing her. Um, then she claimed she had a stalker and she claimed a whole bunch of things. As a matter of fact, she claimed the CIA was after her, the FBI was after her, the Russian mob was after her. Everybody was after her. She's clearly delusional. And they play this down too. And, and as far as how many things she's, people she said were after her. Having a stalker, yeah, I get that. You know, you're dating people that, you know, you're, you're, you're dancing for. Um, and they, they, they glom onto you and they want to see you again because they want you to be their girlfriend. Um, and unless you and that's unless the guy's like a multimillionaire, you don't want to become his girlfriend because he's just a sleazy dude down the street. So chances are you say no, but he keeps coming around and he stalks you. I get that. The mob, the CIA, the FBI, all these people are stalking. Now that's called delusional. What sent her into a delusional state two weeks before she went missing? So all these things are important. And I just point this out because I want you to understand that. When 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 they do these documentaries, they're oftentimes very, very they, they don't know what's going on. They don't understand the world out there. They don't understand it. Massage parlors are prostitution joints. Go go places. Most of the girls in there, the, the more you do drugs, the more you do prostitution on the side. Um uh just just I mean, stripping, yeah, same thing. Oh, there's just all these covers. And on top of that, she went to work at this place. See. Oh, she went to work at this place. Oh, sorry, not the not the not, not the pizza place. That would be a nice place to work at. Where did my picture go? See, it's another one I lost. <laughs> she didn't go to work. If she'd gone to work at the pizza place, things would be kind of good. You know, they really would be kind of good. But no, she went to work at this. Um, and it, this surprised some people. Let's see if I can find the picture. Hmm, I've lost it again. Where did my picture go? Oh, I, yeah. damn it. I have the most worst trouble with pictures. I did have the picture. It just went missing. I mean, she worked this place called like, I think it's called Sex World. Um, hold on a second. Let me find it. Um, and this it's, she, she lived in New Jersey. And when you live in New Jersey, there were a whole pile of like go, go places around. And though some of them are actually let you wear a bath, uh, like a, like a swimsuit, you know, as opposed to being topless or whatever, doesn't mean that you weren't prostituting on the side, but at least you could wear a swimsuit when you danced around. And she went on into New York to one of the sleaziest joints ever. Um, I may tell you the name of it because now I forgot, lost my dang picture because I'm good at that. <laughs> Where's my picture? Uh, I'm just looking for the name of the place now. Um, it was considered, oh, here. It was considered, it was called Show World. Show World Center, live nude review, XXX movies. And then the Super Vixen Live. And they had like levels of floors you could go into to be a part of this. And it was really sleazy live sex shows um, and, and booths men could go into and all kinds of creepy stuff. So she went there and worked there. And people are like, well, she's in Jersey. You know, if she's in Jersey, why can't why can't she work there in Jersey where she can make money and be right near home? Why is she going into New York City and working in one of the sleaziest dumps ever? Good question. She seemed to have she seemed to like to walk on the wild side. She seemed to have issues. Okay, and this is why I want to point out: people try to present as just a person trying to make some money. No, she had severe psychological issues. Anybody who gets into this kind of stuff and doesn't walk away from it, they got some issues going on. Um, where if you're going there and you start seeing that this is probably not a safe thing to do, that this is not probably a good thing to do. Now, I'm not saying there's not women who work in the field for, you know, for a number of years and then realize, wow, you know, get my brain together, get out of it. That's cool. I'm off of that. Um, but she never got out of it. She's 36 years old. And she's like, she actually said, um, I don't think I can do a regular job because I'm so ill now that I can't, I think every day I go in, I'd have to leave. 
well, she's basically saying she's got a drug addiction problem. And nobody's paying attention to this. And so all these, these, these videos going on seem to present her as being happy the day she just disappeared. Uh, she was not. Um, and I think it's important, just very important to point this stuff out. Did danger lurk around her is another question. In the house that she had the vampire boyfriend and the ex-husband, could they have done her in? And some people think they killed her. Uh, some people also think she was murdered by vampires. She wrote a story about vampires. She went into the vampire world because supposedly uh, the guy worked for this guy. <laughs> he had this, he got this tip, James Ridgway did, that vampires, people who were in the vampire world were stealing blood from the blood banks in New York. So he, he suggested she check into that. So she checked into it and it came up a big dumb story. So, but anyway, she, she got herself her own vampire and then she was involved in a lot of kind of creepy things. And um, they dumped the story and she was really pissed about that. Then she wrote another story. It's called, um, so you see her name Walsh here, but you see Ridgeway gets the main part of it, but Russian bear, Russians bear in Jersey bars. So now the concept is they're bringing Russian dancers in and they're ending up working as prostitutes as opposed to being actual dancers. Um, and so the Russian mafia is now after her. So do these worlds exist? Yeah, they exist. They do exist. And I'll, I'll tell you a little story because I do have a story. I'm not a storyteller about this, <laughs> this stuff. But I want to tell you a little story about, if you can find it. Here we go. Here's a picture. That is me. And that's a friend of mine who's with me. I won't give her name. But anyway, we're nine. I was 19. I think she was a little older than me. My father took this picture because I wanted to be a model, you see. And so we dressed up and he took some pictures for uh, of us. And I was planning to go at some point to Hollywood. And, and I did. And that didn't work out well because I didn't cooperate with the casting couch. But anyway, for some freaky reason, and I do not know the answer to this, <laughs> my friend and I decided to go to New York City. I drove because I had a car. She did not. I don't even, I don't remember why we went there, how we ended up there and how we ended up. We had a, we had a job possibility. It was a club, but we thought we were going to be hostesses. <laughs> okay. So we went in this club. It was very fancy, but also kind of had that feeling of fake fancy. You know what I mean? And a lot of guys flashing money and we were, I, we were brought in to, for the interview. And we both got, did the interview. And then we were told we could come back and start work the next morning. We walked out of there. And we both looked at each other and said, I'm pretty sure that's mafia. I don't know if it's Italian mafia or Russian mafia, but we got in the car and we just drove out of there. Um, I still have no idea how we ended up there, but we knew right away that this was creepy. All right. So, so Susan was involved in an extraordinarily creepy world. There's nothing nice about this world that she involved herself in. She, it's a rough world. It's, it's sex with anonymous men. It's drugs, alcohol, and it's, 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 it's re fairly repulsive. And, um, and then she has a son. She wants to be the best mother for her son. I don't understand this. You have a journalism degree. You had opportunities. That was the choice you made. You say you want to be a good mother, but you, you're going to be a prostitute when your child's growing up. You're going to be a drug addict. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that's not being a good mother and living with vampire dude upstairs and having your, okay. You live a creepy life and, and you're not really making the right choices. You're making all the worst choices and people need to stop trying to erase those and trying to say, oh, she was just, you know, she's a great journalist. She was a wonderful, incredible person, blah, blah, blah. She lived a very, very destructive life. And that destruction goes on to her child because that's not what a good mother does. Sorry. Now I understand if I understand a mother getting involved in prostitution, if there's zero choices in life, zero choices, she had choices. So she was enamored by that life. She was addicted. And she even says that she was addicted to the life. She liked getting on the stage. She liked the power she got over controlling the men. She liked probably the money she got, but I also think she liked the drugs she got with the money she got. So she went into a vicious cycle that put her at this point where right when she went to disappear, 
what ended up being the reason she disappeared. Was it that she ran away to start a new life? Was it that she wanted to run away, but her husband didn't want her to leave with the kid? Because that's a, a theory, that, and he killed her. Was it that she pissed off her boyfriend, and he killed her? Was it that her husband and her boyfriend killed her? Was it that uh, one, of her, one of the guys she went off with, uh, a, a trick, did he kill her? Was it the Russian mob? Was it the vampire world? That's why all these theories go about, because when you're involved in a very, very dark world, there's a lot of little creatures in that dark world, including yourself. And that's very important. So now I'm going to get on to the day she went missing. But I wanted to bring up, before we started, because nobody else will do it, is what world she actually lived in and where her brain was at. And it wasn't a good place. It was absolutely not a good place. I'll check your comments and then I'll go to the day she went missing. All right. Um, um, we don't know that, Sarah. Grabbed by a client who's paid to return. We see this is this is where it gets very convoluted, and I'll get into all of that. Um, uh, I would say she was definitely on drugs. There's just, there's, 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 oh, I'm sorry, uh, probably on drugs. Absolutely. She she basically admits that. And this kind of world to be able to to manage it to be to be able to work all night long, come home, try to supposedly take care of your kid and do journalism. I'm going to say she's on some kind of amphetamines. Um, don't know what they were. But the, the more important thing is she's broke. If you work this much, turning tricks and making money at bars, you should have some money. But she's always dead broke. Why? Why is she so broke? Because the money's going somewhere. And people don't want to talk about where the money's going. Um, maybe she just like hooking. She might. I mean, some people enjoy, uh, they enjoy the, it, it's easier than, oh, let's say some people like prostitution because it's easier than typing. <laughs> you know, you got to sit all day long and type this boring thing, or you can just, and then by the end of the day, you're making, oh, what, what was it back in the day? Maybe $10 an hour at the end of the day, maybe $80. Hey, you screw a guy for an hour. <laughs> you're already over the 80. Yeah. Yeah. People, and, and some people who, once they get accustomed to the concept of it, it's not that big a deal. It's it's an acting job. And so they're not they're bent, bent out of shape over it. So this is true. And some love the power they get over the person that is groveling for them and giving them this ridiculous amount of money just so they can have their moment of sex. Yeah, there there is an ego thing also attached. So yes, some people do. And but apparently, you know, some people uh, but a lot of people are on drugs. So that's just important. Um, um, the bipolar issue. Oh yeah, okay. Let me let me talk about the bipolar issue. Well, probably shouldn't, because everybody gets pissed off at me. Um, bipolar is a more recent designation for a person who seems to have varied up and ups and downs. It's supposed to be a chemical problem. And I know I'm going to get a lot of flack over this because I always do. And then people hate me and then just <laughs> and I leave my channel. But there's no, there is no proof that it is a chemical disorder. I'm sorry. There just is no proof that that is what it is. What often happens is people go in because their lives are out of control. Um, because they can't handle the ups and downs. Because some people are very highly narcissistic. And what will happen is, like, for example, let's say you're, you're a comedian. You go on, you know, you go on stage and you perform your act and everybody boos you off the stage. You, you, you know, before you get on, you're like on a, on a high and then they boo you off the stage and you drop like a rock. And, and a lot of people in the entertainment industry have high levels of egos. And when their egos are being supported, they're zippy. And when their egos not being supported, they crash. Now, some people say, no, that's not what uh, bipolar is about. It's like you completely go out of control. You just run around like he can't sleep for 24 hours. We can argue that all day. She was at some point supposedly diagnosed as bipolar and given some medication, but she was a drug addict and an alcoholic. So, and she seemed to have an, an addiction to the industry. So I can't say whether the bipolar label to me uh, is meaningful outside of the fact she had emotional problems. And it's clear she has emotional problems. She's chosen to work in a field, even though her child is growing up in that field. 
and she she can't seem to get away from it that means she has severe emotional problems what whatever they are it could be the supposed bipolar she could she could um be borderline personality disorder who knows we just don't know um let's see um let's see um Um, I'd be interested in knowing how long she, Jill says she'd been in the sex industry, how she was introduced to it and how her involvement changed over time. Um, I don't, I like to know that myself, Jill, because none of these, uh, none of these documentaries bother to tell us. Um, apparently she supposedly got into it during, uh, college, um, to pay for her college bills. A lot of times girls are introduced by other women that they meet and they go, Hey, you should come down here. You can, you know, you can make good money. You, 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 you know, you, you need money. I got a way for you to make money. Some girls don't know what they're getting into. They think they're going to just dance. They think they're just going to give a massage. They think they're just going to do something that's not um, prostitution. They find out within a day that it is prostitution because like in a massage parlor, if a girl shows up at a massage parlor and she actually gives a massage and nothing more, the next day she's going to be fired. At least the boss will bring her in and say, hey, the guys are complaining about you. Nobody had happy endings. Nobody got a blowjob. Nobody got anything from you. She's like, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to do those things. Well, then you can leave right now. Because why do you think the guys come here? Do you think they come here for a freaking massage? Because you all have no talent for massages. That's a place down the road that gives legitimate massages for way less. <laughs> you think the guys come here at 2 o'clock in the morning because they have shoulder pain? <laughs> and they get girl named Tammy, <laughs> Tiffany, who's going to give them a great massage for their shoulders. And she's dressed in underwear. Come on now. <laughs> you know, and so what happens is the girl realizes that she either, uh, goes along with the program or she's fired. Well, a lot of times what will happen is the girl will go in there. And when the guy pulls out the money, let's say he pulls out $100, two $50 bills and says, hey. And the girl's thinking. I could be making $10 an hour. It would take me $100. Oh, my God. I could be over with this in 30 minutes. And she takes that money. And then she takes some, some money from a bunch of other guys. And by the time she gets home, she's got more money she made in one day than she might make in a week or two working a regular job. And then she's she's hooked and becomes a hooker. Yeah. So that's how it works. I don't know how that she got into the field. Somebody obviously introduced her or she answered an ad. Um, but... She got in when she was very young in college. So she was in at least almost a decade and a half. And she got, she, I say, some people said absolutely she got into prostitution. She was into uh, uh, sadomasochism stuff. I mean, I don't know if it's true. I don't know what she provided in her services along with dancing. But what bothers me is she doesn't have any money from it, which means to me it's drugs because there's no way you cannot afford a freaking phone. The business is about phones. You know, you can't afford a, afford, afford a phone in your house. Where the hell is your money going to? Can't afford to give your son a, a lunch. That money's going straight into drugs, in my opinion. And I, I, you know, so that's one. When she goes disappearing, drugs may be a huge I issue here. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's say... Um, <laughs> Joe says, hi, Joe. The, the, the paper with murdered by vampires articles looks suspiciously like a UK tabloid. Joe, we have tabloids here too. But yeah, the UK kind of specializes in, in them. That is absolutely true. All right. Let me get to the day she goes missing. And here's where things get really bizarre because every documentary tells a different story. The main story is this. All right. All right, let's go to where she lives. Where's my picture? Do I, did I lose a picture of where she lives? <laughs> okay, here we go. There we go. All right. So this is important to start here. All right. Now, the original story is this. That around 12 o'clock, let me look at my notes, because I got a bunch of them from every documentary. And so now I'm totally confused. <laughs> this is what the dust you. I mean, I have spent, let's say, four documentaries and a book um, 
more than a dozen hours going through this crap and it's all contradictory and it's all over the place. And it's, it's hard to pin anything down because it's like every, everybody is saying the other thing isn't true or they come up with some other witness that can say some crap that doesn't mean anything. The original point was this, that somewhere around 1215. Now, Christian, that's her boyfriend. Let me show you the, the, these two char these characters. Okay, so you know who I'm talking about. This is C Christian Peppo. Um, he is in the, he's worth watching only because he's in the most recent documentary. I think that's the Paramount. <laughs> that's a creepy dude, let me tell you. He is creepy. And he always calls Susan, Susan Walsh. I'm like, wasn't that your girlfriend? Why would you call her Susan Walsh all the time? It, he's a weirdo, and I think he's a liar. And I don't trust him as far as I can throw that guy. But what a creepy dude. But he was in the vampire community. I think I'm right about that. He was a vampire. Anyway, that was her boyfriend that was living. He got to live outside of the basement. He got to live up where the lights are. And this was her husband, Mark, who lived in the cellar. All right, so... The original story is something like this, and it, it say it changes constantly. So I'm going to get, try to give you the original story. That Susan goes to Christian. Christian is sleeping. It's twelve o'clock, so we wonder why Christian is sleeping. Um, he apparently has a job he goes to in the afternoon, and I don't know when he starts his job. I don't know what the hell the job was, but he takes a bus to New York City, um, and. He's sleeping till noon. So I'm like, whatever. All right. Kind of like to sleep till noon myself. But anyway, he's weird. I'm not. <laughs> so anyway, he, he's, he's taking another nap. And, and Susan goes, hey, she goes, I'm, I'm, I'm going out. Um, and I got to make a phone call. Something like that. So then she goes down to the, she takes her son. This is the original story. She takes her son. And she goes down to the cellar and she says to Mark, watch my son. I got to go make, watch our son. I got to go make a telephone call. And supposedly you say, well, he's got a phone. Why doesn't he let her use the phone? Well, apparently his problem was that she was making phone calls. To people who didn't have names. Why didn't they have names? Because they were tricks. Okay, <laughs> Tricks are drug dealers. Tricks are drug dealers. So he's like, I don't want this crap coming through my phone. You know, I don't want you calling this kind of garbage. You can call. A, a documentary company, you can call a friend, but I want to know what their name is before you call. I want to know you're calling a real person. I respect this guy for this, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. One does have to wonder why he hooked up with her in the first place, but maybe he did see her at a time when she wasn't dancing, um, and I don't know, but maybe he's just trying to be near his son, so he's putting up with everything she's got to offer. So he's like, well, I'm, I'm over it. She's already obviously a prostitute. So she wants to hook out with a vampire upstairs and have different boyfriends, which she had quite a few of them. Um, I'm just going to go along with that because I want to at least see my son. Maybe he's a really good father. So anyway, he tells her, you can't use my phone. But he actually had one. Now, here's an interesting thing. They keep claiming that he was like, she's a single mom and like he's not working. But he just seemed to have a job. I just, they never talk about what kind of work he does. How does he afford anything? It almost feels like she, they're saying that she's supporting him. Well, if she's supporting him. Why does she not have a phone upstairs? A vampire dude who has a job. She has a job. Why would she be giving the phone to ex, ex husband in the, in the cellar? You see how silly this stuff is. So anyway, he does have a phone and a van. It seems to me like he has some method of some sort of income and she's got none anyway. So <laughs> she goes down. Apparently he won't let her use the phone for, questionable phone calls. So supposedly she drops her son with him and she says, I'm going to go out and make a phone call. She goes out to the phone, which is somebody said about 200 feet from her, from the house to make the phone call and disappears into the, and disappears and never seen again in the house. You have her purse, you have her bipolar meds. Um, you got her pager. Thank God. I remember the word for pager now. <laughs> <laughs> and her little, like, whatever she writes stuff in. She didn't take that stuff with her. She walks out without anything, theoretically. I always think that's kind of funny. People say, oh, she left with nothing. How do you know? They didn't have a second purse and stuff like money and crap in it. How do you know? But anyway, she goes to a phone booth. 
supposedly, to make a phone call and vanishes. So the concept here is that she has, these two guys both say the same thing. She went to the phone. Supposedly the kid goes down and stays with him. Now, right away, um, uh, this, this was a big red flag to me. If the phone thing is even true, and I'll get into how squirrely this phone issue gets. If she had to take her, now he had to go to work, mind you. So he was, uh, he went to work at, let me see, what do you supposedly, um, let me find his timeline. I've got a bunch of timelines. The only way I got these timelines at all was because on that Paramount Plus thing, they threw up stuff on the screen really quickly like this. And I'd like hit the screenshot like over and over again and then try to blow it up so I could see anything because they're trying to make, they're trying to give calm. They're trying to say, this is what these things mean, but they won't let us see these things. You see, this is how they work. So, so um, Christian Peppo, he says, 1215, Susan spoke with him and then she left. Okay. That's when she went, supposed to make this phone call. Um, then it's at 1215, she woke him up, went, I got to go make a call. He says she left the park alone, which is interesting because wasn't she taking her son to her ex? I don't know. But anyway, then um, he goes to work. Uh, he, he leaves for work at 145. So at 1215, she supposedly wakes him up. Supposedly takes the son, son down to him. And then at 145, he leaves. Well, if she's taking her son to stay with the ex in the cellar. She obviously believes he's got to leave and therefore she wants somebody responsible for her son. But if she's only going to make a simple phone call, why the heck does she need to leave her son with him at all? Why not just leave him up with this dude? Why would she even do that? I mean, if you're only going to be gone for five or 10 minutes, if the kid's 11 years old too, it's not like it's a two-year-old. I mean, the kid can run up and down the stairs for hours and you know, nothing's going to happen to him. Why couldn't, if she's got even gone for half an hour, why would she just... Tell her son, I got to go make a phone call and leave him wherever the hell he is in that place. But supposedly she takes him to him. And that immediately set up a red flag for me. I'm like, it almost seems like she knows that he's going to leave for work and her son will be there alone. So she's taking him there, the son to the ex, because she needs him to watch him past 145. So she's not just going to make a little phone call, is she? She's going to do something else. She either made the phone call and somebody picked her up and then she went off. Or she ran off, period. Went off with a drug dealer or whatever she ran off with. Their agent, as the friend says, agent, really drug dealer. No, did she go, no, go going off to do drugs. But she wanted her son safe, so she left the son with the husband. That was the first thing I thought. Then we have another story about the, she goes off to the phone booth. This The phone booth, by the way, is in, in three of the shows. I mean, it's everywhere. It's like the phone booth, the phone booth, the phone booth. She left at, what was it, 12.15. She's goes to the phone booth to make a phone call. Now she did use the phone booth a lot because she had a pager and I guess he wasn't home or and the phone was not working. She'd go to the her friends say, yeah, I, I paid her and she'd go to a phone booth wherever she was. All right. So now we have this interesting situation. Now we have a story that supposedly she goes off to the phone booth, but then she's never seen again. Ah, but then we get fascinating information. The pizza shop across the street, a guy working there saw her. Let me show you. That was a picture. I was, <laughs> this is it. It's, uh, what is it? I can't even read that. Retaco? Is that Retaco or Relaco? Okay. Anyway, they're the brothers. They have a brick oven pizza. Probably really good because it's not in Maryland. And I wish I could have some right now. Supposedly, this guy in the pizza shop saw her leave the phone booth and return to her house. Oh my God. Now that is breaking news because if she didn't disappear from the phone booth and she actually went back into the house, what about these two guys? And, uh, they didn't, they did see her after she made the phone call. All right. So here's the problem there. Okay. I'm like, okay. So they say in, in one of these documentaries, the pizza place across the street. So I went to look for the pizza place across the street. This is what it came up with. All right. Now, if you will note, okay, let me show you. Okay. Let, let me put this behind me. All right. Uh, okay. This is their house. This is, I forgot what store this is next to them. 
and this is it's like an apartment complex it's got some different you no know, i guess it's divided up they lived here all right so that's where they live and you'll know see see this kind of like triangle thing here with the lines that's kind of a good way to visualize things all right so now let's look at that street so here we have the street wait a minute did i just hold on a second <laughs> i screwed that up i, I left the picture on on top of me <laughs> okay back again this is their house this is the place next door to the, the the complex whatever store that is and this is their place that they live and this is the triangle that you can see is it's it helps you understand the pictures I'm now going to show you and cover my face with. All right. So what do we have here? All right. Here we got one. Now look to your left. You'll see that building. That's a store. You see the gray top. That's where they live. Do you see down there the pizza sign? And it says that our taco brothers brick oven pizza. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't call that across the street. I crawl, say across the street and all the way down to the end of it. What do you think? I just want to know. Do you think that's across the street? What do you think? So the guy's looking out. He's, he's busy. But he looks out the window and he sees her leave the phone booth and go back into her house. Because he's just across the street and can see this. And this is in, a, this is in the documentary, by the way. One of them or two of them. I can't even... Can't even figure out how many of them showed this at this point. Um, Kitty cornered. Yeah. But very, very far away. That's remember, he, remember the other one said 200 feet. Well, 200 feet is not real close. You know, across the street is, is not 200 feet. Um, what does dichotomy? Oh, is that we're in something different? Well, totally not across the street. It's far away. Absolutely. Let's look at a couple more pictures. Cause I took a bunch of them. I went on like whatever I went on. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to get more things over my face. There we go. All right. Let's look at a couple more of these pictures. Okay. Let's see. Here's another one. This is, uh, this is, you can see the house on the left or the apartment on the left. And then way up there is the pizza place way down, down the way here again. See how far away that freaking thing is. What is this guy got? I, oh, is he an eagle or something? I mean, where the hell was the phone booth? Now, wouldn't you think if the phone booth was so freaking important, one of these documentaries would say, this was the phone booth. Now, it may not be there today because we don't have many phone booths left. But couldn't you put an X on a map and say this is where the phone booth is? Nobody bothers because documentary people don't seem to care about facts. And so I don't know where the damn phone booth was at all. I mean, I have no clue. So I'm looking at this going, well, if the guy's looking out the window of this pizza place, where the hell is the phone booth? And how would he see her go to her house? He might see her walk away from the phone booth, but unless that guy's a stalker, which she claims she has, you know, I'm like, what the heck? How is he going to see anything that distance? And why is he paying attention? He's supposed to be working. So, and who is this person? So the concept that she went to the phone booth and then somebody saw her return to the house is very questionable. And this is an important thing because if she did return to the house, it would make things different. It would make sense that she left her stuff in the house, but it wouldn't make sense still that she would tell she, she'd have to put her child with her, her uh, husband because she's only going to make a phone call for God's sake. She's going to be right back. You know, that's not unnecessary. So I have a problem with the phone booth thing all the way around. Did she go to the phone booth? Did she ever go to the phone booth? Was she ever wanting to go to the phone booth? Now, I think two things are possible. One is they say there were no phone calls ever made from the phone booths in the area. And I don't know the validity of this, but in the latest show, they have some paperwork, which I don't know the validity of that either. Um, but is it possible? She said, I'm going to the phone booth. She had already made some earlier phone calls. And now she says, I'm going to go around out to the phone booth. Was she going to meet somebody out there who was already pre-planned and she was going to meet them and I don't know, get drugs from them, do a trick, turn a, tr turn a trick and get drugs and, and vanished right there. That person drove off with her and that was the end of it. Or did she run off at that point? Did she decide I've got, I've got stuff in a little bag here. Nobody says whether she had anything in her hands or her pockets or whatever. She could have said, I'm going to leave my stuff here because I don't want people following me. I don't want my ID because I don't want people to know who I am. I've got some money. 
I'm going to, I got somebody to grab me. I'm going to go off someplace else. I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn tricks because I need drugs. And there was a woman who said two weeks afterwards that she came and stayed with her in, a, I think it was Trenton or was it Newark? Might've been Newark. Anyway, she said she came and stayed with her for two weeks. She found her on the street and she was working and she supposedly got information from her that the police hadn't released. So like she knew about the kid and everything. Um, and she said, I don't want to go back. Um, and why didn't she want to go back? Well, she had two friends that were supposedly going to do an intervention because they she they thought she was spiraling downhill and they were going to do an intervention. Maybe she didn't want to go to rehab. Maybe she didn't want people to get into her life. And she said, screw it all. I'm just going to run off. She could have done that. Now, she's never been found. So sometimes once you once you run off, you run into bad situations, bad drugs, bad people. You end up dead and you end up someplace else. Um, or you com someplace you commit suicide and they just don't know where your body is. It's possible. But that's one theory that she could have run off or gone off with somebody because this whole, this whole issue about the phone is, is, is so questionable, but she does. There, there was also, I'll get to that one in a minute. So the, anyway, that was, that's one theory that she just ran off or she went off and committed suicide because she left everything. She's like, screw it all. I've got my, my, I'm a mess. Um, I'm a mess. And I, I just want to, you know, I, don't, I can't deal with it anymore. I can't deal with the life anymore. I'm getting older. Nobody wants to pay me much anymore. Um, I'm, I'm fed up with vampire dude. I don't like my husband, <laughs> my ex, um, my kids better off without me. People do that, but they haven't found her body. So, that's why the theory is maybe she didn't kill herself. Maybe, maybe she, she could have died of drugs someplace and somebody got rid of her body. She could have been killed by a trick. Uh, but, and then there are those who think she was killed by the vampire group or the Russian mob. And she said pr prior to her, her going missing, um, that everybody was after her. Now, first of all, the vampire group, there's no reason for the vampire group to kill her. It makes no sense at all. So she said, Oh yeah, we do. They drink blood and have sex. Who cares? I mean, they're already weirdos. I mean, they, they don't care about that crap. And as far as the Russian bar, Russians and the Jersey bars, yes, yeah, she did go in and do some investigation. But the main guy who was responsible for this thing being published is James Ridgeway, who is the voice, uh, the village voice guy. It wasn't this 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 girl who came in and asked questions. Um, sure, they may be pissed off. I can I can see that they beat her up in a back alley. I get that. But this was, I mean, this, this thing had been out for quite a while and she was still walking around. So, I mean, if you're going to get rid of somebody, you get rid of them quick. I don't think they considered her a big, huge fat threat because they went on with the, the, the bars went on with their business. And this, this article was just a tabloid article. Um, so the vampires clearly not, I don't believe the Russians had anything to do with it. And the fact that she thought everybody was after her shows me she's paranoid. You're usually paranoid from excessive drug use uh, because there's, there's no reason to think, except for a stalker. I, got, I can go for a stalker. There was this one guy. This is an ex-boyfriend, supposedly ex-boyfriend dude. And she had a restraining offer, uh, 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 a restraining order against him. His name was Billy Walker. Now her, um, and he, he, he was supposed to be a creepo dude. But that he showed up at exactly that time when she went out to the phone booth or didn't go out to the phone booth. She wasn't going to hang out with him. So there was no nothing linking him to her. She put out the restraining order. He never broke it. Um, but her, but her vampire boyfriend, he says, Oh my God, yes, that's the guy who did her in. And so some people think, well, it's because he's trying to protect himself. You know, he's a creepy dude. Maybe he killed her or maybe helped him, helped him kill her. <laughs> so I will say this. I see nothing that says the Russian mob vampires, even a stalker specifically killed her. So then we come down to two possibilities. She she went off that day on her own accord uh, because she wanted drugs because she was running dr doing a trick and, and drugs. Uh, she was running away because she just couldn't face anything anymore. She had some money with her and people just don't know it. She went and figured she'd make more money turning tricks. That's the major stuff. But now we get to the theories that come out in the most recent documentary that one of these two guys is the one who killed her or both of them killed her. Now, the theory being that, and, and this is, this is the guy that promotes most of this stuff. Um, this fellow, he's on, he's in the uh, 
Paramount Plus one. His name is Larry Millen. M Millen. Maybe it's Millen. Former police chief. Well, I thought that dude, I thought he was probably, you know, involved in the case. Ah, the two guys that do show up in the, in the case, if you go back to the, which documentary was it? Uh, if you go back to the one Clarissa told me to watch, which was, uh, yep, just, yeah, Dancing in the Darkness. Uh, this one has two detectives in it. One is one of the originals, and one is a guy who comes in in 2005 to do a review. Um, and in 2022, apparently, I think it's a documentary people through the family got all of the police files as far as I can see. So they're like in this documentary, um, the, the um, a Paramount one, they're going to say who actually did it. This is the big breaking news and hey, we have new stuff. And so they have that he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't in the documentary. He's like, I'm done with this crap. Christian Papo does love to be, he loves to talk. So he's there and the two girls are there, um, the two, the two friends and um, some family of a couple family members. And then this guy. Yeah, he's oh, sorry. Not that guy. Um, <laughs> where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Uh, yeah, this guy. Sorry, I got to pause over his face. Uh, Larry Millen. So I'm thinking that guy has something to do with this. No, he doesn't. He, he's just hired for the documentary. He has nothing to do with this case at all. So he's analyzing whatever the documentary people threw at him. So he comes up and so what he's got here now, he says, well, you know, most people are killed by people they know. And that's true. So therefore, the people she knew were these two guys. She was living with them. And they were the last people to see her alive, which is also true. So could it be these two guys? Did I mean, they had issues with her probably. I don't know if he had any issues with her. He was just like, I don't know what he does. Because nobody told me what kind of job he has whether he does drugs. I'm going to think maybe both of them might've been doing drugs. I don't know. And he's got this basically hooker girlfriend who is sleeping with other men, but that's okay with him, I guess. And he watches her kids sometimes. And then he got the husband in the basement. <laughs> and um, what's he doing down there? And what's it, why is he putting up with everything? But maybe he's just lost all his feelings for her. And he's like, I'm going to help out with my kid. And uh, she sleeps with everybody. So I'm not going to get all bent out of shape about it. Or, or did he? So there's a theory as to why he might. They never came up with a good theory for why he might do something. They do come up with a good theory for why Mark Walsh might do something. So anyway, this guy comes on and he's now giving this, this story about that day, what really happened that day. And he's using, okay, so here's one of the things you see coming across on the channel, the Nutley Police Department Law Enforcement Sensitive. Now, I don't know if this is from the Nutley Police Department, or it's to the Nutley Police Department. You see, you can't really tell. It says persons of interest in the Susan Walsh case. Mark Walsh, the husband, Christian Pepo, the, the boyfriend, and Billy Walker, the, the ex-boyfriend stalker dude. And then they talk about the timeline of interest is 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on that particular day in 86, uh, July 16th. And then if you read further, it says during the past few months, January, March, January through March 6th, the Nutley Police Department detectives somebody, okay, supposedly is not the police department guy, conducted a review of the Susan Walsh case. Um, you know, when you say January to March, okay, so, oh, this is 2006. Okay, this is the, take this back. That is the guy that came in years later uh, to review things. All documents, statements, video, and whatever provided to the Nutley Police Department, carefully an analyzed by some Detective Lieutenant, and for some reason his name isn't there, and another detective whose name isn't there, and then they talk to the mother of Susan and employer and co-author of Susan's book, Red Light. It's not, Susan did not, it's not her book. <laughs> they can't, they can't even get that right. So this, so they're saying in this statement that this, the detective did conduct a review, but then it says, based on our review of the case, is that the detective's review or somebody else's review? I don't even know. And you see how there's like, stains in the top of that it's like oh this is really old i don't know they didn't stain the shit themselves those documentary people to make it look like something that didn't happen in 2022 but somehow happened way back then based on our review of the case including interviews with it's our recommendation that the nutley police department 
So somebody is recommending to the Nutley Police Department. And that sounds like it's not the actual detective in the Nutley Police Department. Um, that, uh, that this investigation with our focus, who's our focus? Who's actually focusing this? You know, our focus is not apparently the original detective in 2006. Sounds like these two detectives who are unknown, who are now reviewing it. Uh, they're focusing on three persons of interest, see above, in pursuit of uh, obtaining answers. I don't know the, the, the validity of this paperwork, who it's from, who it's to, and who's involved. This is documentary crap. Drives me crazy. By the way, I should stop here and say, hey, you people who just got all those, all the documents from the police department, I am available to review all of them because at least I'll tell the truth. I don't know who committed this. I don't know if she committed the crime herself by leaving and ODing someplace or committing suicide or whether somebody else took advantage of her at some point, became angry with her uh, and, and killed her. I don't know. I have no clue. So, you know, you can stop my video right now if you're like, oh, dang, I thought Pat was going to tell us. I can't absolutely tell you. I would love to see oh, the original information. You want it? want me to look at it? I'm available because from what I'm seeing from the documentary, it's garbage. So if the family is out there who has information and wants me to review it to determine whether the ex-husband has something to do with it or paper had something to do with it or whatever. I need to see the originals because it's all very conflicting information. So the, so the guy comes out and he starts push, pointing to things. And what one of the things he points to is this. He says, when, you, when I look at all the information, nobody talks about in the, in the supposed police reports I'm looking at, nobody talks about going to the phone booth ever. <laughs> they never talk about the phone booth. He just, uh, uh, let me see what I can, oh, my, my page just disappeared. Okay. What we have here, and when I read through all the different, very vague, as all the screenshots I took, that Mark said that at 1055, let's see, okay. Um, this report just says 1055, Susan was on the payphone with somebody. Then at 12.15, she went to meet her agent. At 12.30, Mark Walsh left to uh, left to get his tools at his parents' house who lived in Montclair. And a big deal is made of the fact that he leaves Nutley, drives to Montclair, and then drives back. And later drives there again, supposedly, with his son. So the detective, oh, well, this guy, the retired dude, says, hey, why didn't take the son the first time? I don't know. Anyway. It says at 12.30, he left his son home with Christian. And he takes about an hour. He comes back an hour later. Now, nobody's talking about at 10.55 is not the time she supposedly left the child with, with uh, Mark and went down to the phone at all. So what the heck? That's earlier. That's way earlier. So now we have another statement. Let's look at another statement. All right. Another this is Mark again. Susan came down to my apartment about noon and asked to use the phone. I told her that she could, providing she didn't call anyone who didn't have a name. And so she said, okay, and whatever. So I allow her only to call people with their name, who had names. She made about four calls, one to her driver, one to a person involved in document, but she couldn't get through. I don't know who the other two, call to, other two calls were to. Wait a minute. You won't let her make phone calls to people you don't know, but two of the calls you don't know. So that's kind of makes no sense to me. And then she says she had to meet a guy with all of the CIA stuff because she was saying the CIA was after. I didn't want to know. And then they asked, asked him, did you see her leave? And he said, yes, it was about 1215. She went up, just went up the stairs because he's in the cellar and went, walked out. What happened to the phone booth? What happened to her leaving the son with him and going to the phone booth? It's not in this one at all. And then, then Christian, the this dude upstairs says at 12 15 she spoke with him and then she left her son didn't see her at that time and they're saying why didn't he see the son see her if she was there well maybe his son was just looking somewhere else maybe she, who wasn't paying attention i don't know so supposedly 12 15 she woke him up and said she was going to make some calls he, she, he saw her leave the apartment alone so what she's supposed to be taking her son down to mark but okay he was only half awake and maybe talked about a drug she was taking then at 12.45, he was fully awake, and he watched Ace Ventura with Susan's son until 1.45 when he left for work. 
that's when Mark supposedly is back from his parents' house to be with the son because he knows Christian has to go to work. Uh, so then supposedly when he's going to work, He's at the bus stop, and then he goes out again with his son, sees him at the bus stop, and says, hey, and he says, hey, have you seen Susan? And he's like, no. What happened to the phone booth? Why has the phone booth gone missing? Now she never seems to have gone to the phone booth at all. She seems to have just left the house. She made some phone calls and left the house. Who's telling the truth here? I mean, it makes no sense to me at all. Then we get another interesting statement from a girl by the name of Melissa. This was one of these women, though, her friends, this is Melissa, who was, all work, was also, I think, a sex worker at the time. Um, Melissa says, depending on what, what show you're watching, I tried paging her and she didn't respond. She's going to do this, this uh, in intervention to try to get her off the drugs and stuff. So she's going to meet this guy, other person, and do that. I tried paging her and she didn't respond, so I went over. The door that was usually open was locked shut. The windows were shut and locked on a hot day. She says that, she says in one of the, <laughs> documentary set the fans have been taken out of the windows and the windows were shut and locked did she check the locks of all the windows i mean who does that i mean and why if you had to the imp implication is that like there's a body in there but you know i prefer to keep the windows and the fans going if i had a body in there and you know the other thing i wouldn't do if i were trying to get rid of her and make it look like she ran away i wouldn't be leaving all her her her, her purse and her medicine and her pager there, I'd be taking those too and dumping all of them together so it looks like she went away. I wouldn't leave them on the table. Um, then she says, there were no cars there at the time. So that means Mark was not at home. So this is about three o'clock in the afternoon. It's very, they, again, they're not doing things very properly. Like if you're going to give a, a documentary, could you get the facts so we know exactly what happened? Um, I knew something had happened. So she thinks it's weird that she's not there, right? I returned an hour later and Mark pulled up. David was with him. That's the, that's the son. And they had bags from Staples. I guess they went to st uh, there to get school supplies. They said they hadn't seen um, uh, Susan. So about four o'clock, Mark pulls up with, with his son after going to Staples. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that probably if he just killed his mother, going to Staples for school supplies is kind of unusual. But, you know, maybe he's got a cool head, you know. Where is her body at this time? I get is it in, is it in, inside and the, and the windows are all closed and, and just, I mean, so she didn't leave the house. She, they got in an argument, I guess. Okay. And let's see. And then an hour later, the other friend, Joey, he's a guy that, um, uh, is a driver for her, uh, takes her places because she doesn't have a car, you see. And also sometimes they, they, they double as um, uh, essentially as guards, uh, security for you when you're tricking. Okay. Um, he waits an hour. She doesn't show up. And so next day Mark calls her. So she's missing that. She's clearly missing because uh, her friend is supposed to get together with her. Joey shows up to take her to work. She's not there. She never shows up supposedly any place. And the next day, 24 hours from then, Mark goes to the police and says, hey, she's missing. And some people make a big deal of that because they're like, well, you know, what took them so long? Well, I'll tell you, you should go to the police before 24 hours. They're not going to listen to you. On top of that, when you tell, tell, her, tell them that the woman you're, that's gone missing is, is in, in the sex business, they're not exactly rushing out the door. And also she's got drug problems. So, you, you know, you can't, you can't run, run there. Oh, she's been gone for four hours. They're not going to laugh at you. So I can't fault Mark. Let's go back to just so we can see Mark here. Um, I don't fault Mark for waiting 24 hours. I think that's perfectly reasonable. He probably had no idea what she was up to. If she's got drug problems and she's hooking, he doesn't know where she's at. She could be doing anything. I don't know how many times she's done this before. And of course, that question is never answered in the documentaries. Did, did she often have problems? Usually people do drugs and alcohol and are working in, in prostitution don't keep really good hours. That's why she needed two men to watch her kid because she's not always where she should be. So I think he waited 24 hours and said, okay, now it's weird because normally she would be back because apparently she, he had to go to work. Imagine that. Although we don't hear that he ever works. So he goes to police and tells them 
hey, you know, she never showed up. He goes to the police station. And the the the, the guy in the, sh in, the, in the documentary says, oh, why didn't he just call and have the police come to him? He must be hiding something. No, he went to the police station. And they came over to his house and checked everything out. I mean, that makes no sense either. And again, if he wanted to make it look like she'd gone off, why would, why, if he's taking her body away, why does he take the rest of the crap away, her purse and her pager and her drugs? So, so there's all, then there's these weird theories about when how it all happened. There's a story that was told that uh, they got in this argument um, before she left, and she told him she was going to take their son and go off to Florida because she has some cousins down there. She's going to start her life down there with her son. So he picked up a large frying pan and whacked her over the head with it. And he was mad, so he hit her and he accidentally killed her. Okay, first of all, she thinks the CIA is after her, the FBI is after her, the Russian mob is after her, and vampires maybe too, and stalkers. Do you think he's really going to say, oh my God, you're just rushing off with my kid, you're going to leave? She can't afford the phone bill. You think she can afford getting to Florida and taking her son with her? And somebody says, so, they, so they're trying to test, say it's a custody case. Okay, you go before a judge at this point. Dad has a stable place to live. He's been taking care of his 11-year-old boy. You think the judge is going to side with the prostitute drug-using mother? Now, maybe the kid were two years old or maybe it needs to nurse. Yeah. But the boy's 11. He needs his dad more than he needs his mom at that point, especially a mom who's a freaking mess and probably going to need to go to rehab. He's not, he's not going to lose in a court of law. So and he, I don't think he would believe, oh, my God, yeah, she's definitely running away. But this is in the Paramount uh, Plus a video. That's what the new theory is, that he, let me see if I can show you this. They put this together so you can really see things. Law enforcement sensitive. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Who put together this nonsense? So, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure they just made this up for the show. Um, if somebody wants to tell me that this actually was in the law enforcement files, I'd be surprised. Mark Walsh suspect in red. Okay. And it says here to the right, new information that can't, comes in in uh, 2000 something or other, because I can't read it. Uh, uh, Mark and Susan argue about Susan taking the son to Florida. Really? Okay. So that, that, that's the, that's the new theory because since he's not dating her and since he's not having a relationship with her and she's been with so many other men, what's he killing her for? It makes no sense except for now they've come up with a motive. She was going to take the son and go to Florida. Only what are the chances she was really doing that? Was there any proof she was doing that? And there was there any proof that he couldn't stop that. I mean, I just, that's just nonsense to me. So they, they're making up a motive for why he could have done it. For, for, and then they have these other interesting ideas. So somehow um, the reason he's running back and forth to his moms, and uh, I don't know why. I mean, they can't even come up with their explanation for this stuff, that he, he lied about this and he's, he's inconsistent about that. Um, but he killed her, and so somehow she's in the house and then I guess later that night, um, later that night uh, when he's sleeping, he can just leave the kid with him, I guess. Cause, and then he can take the body and do something with it. And of course, this has happened in 2022. And supposedly, oh, the police were interested in this reservoir that was behind his dad's house and some other place that her body could be. And now it's 2024 and nothing's happened there, as you can see. And so the other theory is, this, is, this one gets really stupid. Some, so so the same the same guy on the show the same retired uh, detective says but she was also people said they saw her at 3 a.m and so we will also possible that she was out till 3 a.m and then came home and that's when she was killed okay so all the stuff that happened during the day would be meaningless wouldn't it <laughs> the phone calls and inconsistencies and going to staples in his mom's house and him saying weird stuff. I mean, none of that would matter because she was same at 3 a.m. But now she comes back at 3 a.m. and he kills her. And then yet that's why he waits till 1230 the next day to report it to the police because he's off doing something with her body. And see, this is this is this is how you analyze a case. It's so pitiful. It's 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 just absolutely astonishing. 
but this is what you do in documentaries. So, so far with the documentaries, we have an inconsistent, I, not only inconsistent from them, I can't tell whether the documentaries are lying. Who is telling the truth? Did she go to the freaking phone booth or didn't she? Did a pizza guy really see her at the phone booth or didn't he? Did she ever return to the house or didn't she? Do these people, guys have alibis? They have alibis for a lot of that day. He was with his son most of the day. And he was, they were both interviewed way back when. Son apparently didn't see anything. Uh, police cleared him back in the day. It's only during the review or the, or the, or the documentary review uh, that suddenly he becomes a major suspect. And, you know, they really put, the, the Paramount really basically painted the, the murder on him. And I don't know how he feels about that. Oh, they also said that, um, and, and the detective back in 2006 said also that when he did a review, which was 10 years later, they went to the house. He's still living in that dump. So I'm not going to say the guy's got some issues. Anyway, he's living in the same dump and with his son. So he's still raising a son and a son by then, well, it's like, like an adult. And they, they wanted to, um, uh, I guess, check out, check his place for evidence. And he said, no. And he sent them away and said, get me, get a search warrant. And they're like, that may, that's really suspicious. And supposedly his lawyer told him to do that. Now I'm wondering why he has a lawyer because apparently in the original stuff, he was very, very forthcoming. Originally he, he called all the time. He, Try to, you know, try to help in every way he could. Police were per perfectly happy with him. Ten years later, maybe they can't, the review guys come after him and they're just not very pleasant. He's like, hey, I'm not going back over this again. Leave me the hell alone. I don't know if he called up somebody and they said, hey, they don't have a search warrant. Tell them to go shove it. They didn't have a search warrant. And he he, he may have just been like, I, I've dealt with it. I, I dealt with her for 10 years of my life. I don't want to do it anymore. And so, you know, he just, he's gone on his way. Now he, on the other hand, is a creepy dude. And you watch Paramount and you just, he, he's like, I'm pretty sure it was the stalker that killed her. Absolutely. You know, and he's just weird as hell. And, but I don't see any evidence that he killed her either. So what happened to Susan Walsh? Well, I don't know because I cannot, I cannot actually get enough information from outside the investigation without accessing those police records to find out exactly what the information was about the phone calls and the phone booth and when she left and if anybody ever saw her. Um, what am I inclined to believe? I don't see that either one of these guys have any particular reason to kill her. Um, the stalker really wasn't around. I don't believe it. I don't believe in the, the stupid... Uh, the vampire thing or the Russian mob or the FBI or the CIA or all the other delusions she has. Two weeks before this happened, she went missing. She said to her, the people, the woman, her friend who was making the, the, the film stripped that she was going downhill. She was highly depressed. Supposedly she had attempted to commit suicide. Um, she couldn't handle being in that sex world anymore, but she didn't know how to leave it. Um, she was a wreck. And they said she seemed completely off. Um, they thought she might be on drugs. They didn't know. And so when you have somebody who is uh, is basically spiraling down into drugs and some kind of real emotional uh, crisis, and then they vanish, usually it's not other people who kill them. Usually they either taken themselves out or they have run off because maybe she's, I don't want to go to rehab. I'm just going to, I'm just going to disappear. And I'm just going to, and she did disappear temporarily. Maybe she did work on the streets get drugs. And at some point something went wrong and she truly was murdered um, or she committed suicide um, and they just haven't found her body. Um, or, or she, or she went out that day desperate for drugs, got in a car with a trick and a drug dealer and she, she met a serial killer and that was the end of that. But I will say that whatever happened that day, to me has to do with her spiraling downhill and, um, getting back, getting, losing, losing her, her, she's anybody who's, she's essentially um, delusional. Anybody who thinks all these people are after her, that's delusion. And that delusion usually comes from an emotional crisis plus drugs. And so when she walked out that morning, something was wrong with her. Uh, and so I believe she did leave the apartment. And if she left everything in the apartment, was it because she thought she was coming back 
or is it because she was going to run away? I don't know. But I can't believe that they had any reason to kill her in the apartment. And the son was there, 11 years old, knew nothing about anything. And that you would you would kill her, remove her body, but leave her stuff sitting on the table. So, you know, if you're going to make somebody look like they disappeared, much easier to just take all her stuff and say, I don't know, she left this morning, took her purse, took her pager. We don't know what happened to her. But you don't leave the stuff on the table unless you're really stupid. So I, I, I just can't. I, the way they're moving around all day long, I just don't see that it makes a lot of sense that uh, that anybody killed her. Um, they didn't see it in the beginning. The police went there. They didn't see anything amiss in that sense. Um, so do I believe that he hit her in the head with a frying pan and then because she was going to take his kid away? No, I just I just don't. I just don't. Um, no. So that's where I stand on this. I think that something did happen um, because of her spiraling out of control. And uh, she left the house, I do believe, that morning. And what happened after that, I can't say. So I'll go to your comments now. It's a crazy, it's a crazy case in the sense of the way they're they're displaying it in, in, in these documentaries. It's just horrifying. I mean, I just I just couldn't believe the nonsense. Um, and that's the problem. When you watch these documentaries, you think you're learning what happened, and you're not, especially if they're not going to be honest with you as, as to what actually is happening. Um, what? What is Doko? Do, what is doko shaming? Wait a minute, what does that even mean? <laughs> that's, that's a term I don't know. You can tell me what that means. Um, um, <laughs> wait a minute. Let's see, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Anish Kapoor Taylor looks like a decent. <laughs> I don't know what that means either. I don't understand the conspiracies behind this case. Seems pretty clear cut. Okay, CEO, I want to ask you this. Well, the conspiracy stuff, the Russian mob, the vampires and all that stuff is silly. But they, I think the problem is they don't know what happened to her. I mean, she did disappear. <laughs> that's not a conspiracy. She, That's a fact. She disappeared. And her body and she have never been found. She's not been found, but her body's not been found. Now, is it entirely possible that she could be out in the world living someplace? And I'll say this. Some people think they've seen her here, there, and everywhere. And, of course, we always get those witnesses who think they've seen somebody. But I will also say this. There was a woman, I can't remember who it was, but she had walked away from her family. And they found her like 30 years later, like rolling around Florida. you know. And, and she was actually alive. And that poor husband, he was like accused of killing her for so many years. Um, so she disappears when she's 36. Um you know, when you go into the drug and, and prostitution community and homelessness and whatever you get into and, and maybe, uh, you know, some level of psychosis and all that kind of stuff, it's hard to say whether perhaps you just, you know, you're able to disappear into the world, some grungy little place and people just never know who you are. Is it possible she's out there alive? I don't think it's likely, but I thought I can't actually say it's impossible. Um, but you know, it's also likely that she got into trouble with drugs, um, prostitution and the drugs or somebody killed her or she killed herself. I mean, that's what I would go with. Um, um, Steele says, I feel like the 90s was still a time and you could actually disappear. You know, um, possibly. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, you know, if you go into the right communities, there's a, there are people who've disappeared. I mean, I know one case that I was uh, I did. Uh, and the woman clearly killed the man and ran off and changed her name and did all. She's still out there. I mean, it's been like 10 years now. What, where the heck is she? I mean, you know, and so there are people who are out there um, for sure. Um, well, there you go. List. Yeah, okay. Left his family, start a new life. People do it, uh, you know, and she has something to sell at least, you know, which is her body, although at 36 it's getting the prices are going down. So, you know, it, it's, it's possible. Um, let's say, um, Oh, the one cop said you can only hope she's alive somewhere. Well, you know, <laughs> that's what you say for the documentary. <laughs> um, Oh, Marion says, hi, Marion. Uh, a lot of people disappear. This case doesn't seem to be very unusual. Um, I think it was made unusual because, it was tabloid material and they 
they seem to just love to run with the creepy world of of sex work and the creepy world of vampires and the creepy world of the Russian mob and all of that stuff, I think overshadowed the simple fact that she was a working girl and working, working girls who do drugs live not the best lives. And it's, it's, it's not a healthy life and it's also often a dangerous life. And, but instead of saying, Hey, you know, she just was a, kind of a very sad person. I mean, they keep making this, they keep trying to make her sound like she's just the most fascinating, the most friendly, the most wonderful. She's just the greatest person ever. And she was a journalist, blah, blah, blah. No, she was a very, I, I just have to tell the truth. She was a sad person. She chose a terrible life. She, she failed as a mother. Uh, she, she lived a sordid, horrible life and she was poor, broke and drug addicted. That is, this is not something that's good. Yes, I wish she had. Apparently she had an ability to write. She went to college for God's sakes. Don't I wish she had chosen a different route or she tried the, the, the dancing while she was in college and said, you know, I got through college. I don't need to do that crap anymore. And then she went on with her journalism career. Why didn't she do that? Why didn't she make something of herself? But she didn't. Um, she she descended into a very, very dark world and, and probably either, you know, said a very tragic ending one way or the other. It's, it's not, it's not a pretty story. And they, they just keep trying to blow it up as some kind of like, I don't know, fantastical world or something. I just think that's, it just annoys me because they want you to see, that's why I put the pic, these pictures. I do, I'm not putting those pictures on my, my thumbnail just because I know everybody would be pissed at me, but I'll put those on my thumbnail. This is what people want to say. Oh, she was, no, she was, this is the, um, this is a journalist look. And this is, there she is going, you know, she's, she's just on a, uh, she's been part of a book and she's, uh, she's all happy at a book signing. And here she is with little cute pigtails. This is the, this is the vision they want you to have of, of, of Susan. Um, but, but is that who she was at the end? And that's the sad thing. She might have been these different parts of her were there in reality. I'm not saying she's not a human being. I'm not saying you shouldn't care about it. I'm just saying that these, what she was, eventually she destroyed. She destroyed what was good when she descended into this horrible world. And to make it sound like a good world, like it's not a big deal. She chose to do this. She should have the right to do this, blah, blah, blah. No, she became a drug addict, an alcoholic, and a prostitute. And a, and a very poor person who disappeared. This is not a happy thing. It's not. And I hope every every male and female out there realizes this is not the way you want to go in life. It's not. Um, was her father alive when she disappeared? He looks squirrely. <laughs> there, I can't. I, I think she. I think he was alive. I'm not trying to remember. I, I know that they try to make something of her, her upbringing had issues. Again, I don't know the truth of any of this crap, you know, because where's the proof? You know, where's the proof? Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. Harper has some suicide. Overdose, dealer, sex buyer, she called from the phone, Booth killed her. I'm good with all three of those. <laughs> I mean, something happened to her. I mean, clearly she might have been seen after that because, and this is something people don't understand. Uh, this is one reason it's very difficult for police sometimes to uh, to do the work of, of investigation. Somebody says, oh, you know, uh, so-and-so went missing. Tiffany, Tiffany went missing. You're like, okay, does Tiffany have drug problems? Yes. Where was Tiffany last month? Oh, she was in Atlanta. Where is she? And so now she's in Detroit. Well, she, she came to Detroit a week ago, but now she's missing. So some, some go away with their, their, their pimps. Some go away with their boyfriend. Some, some just j jump a bus and go to another city. Some follow drugs. Some, some join. There's all kinds of things they do. The problem is when you live a life like this 
all kinds of things can happen. And a majority of the time, you're not getting the person that is being investigated isn't being killed. They're just, they're just off doing something else. You can't chase every person who is living an underground lifestyle across the damn globe. You can't do it. You, you know, you have to have some proof that something went wrong, that they truly are in trouble. Um, usually by the time, you know, you can even figure that out, they're usually dead. Whether a serial killer got them, because prostitutes are targets for serial killers. Why? Because when they go missing, it's not that the police don't care. It's they have no clue who the hell took them. If this is the way it works. All you need is to drive up. And I, I point, I've, I've done this scenario before, but I think it's worth doing over and over again for, so people understand this. So you have a, 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 what you call John. And John, he goes up to the corner. And on the corner is standing Tiffany and Candy and Susan. <laughs> okay, Tiffany, Candy, and Susan are on the corner. John calls, calls up and says, hey, girls. And then Tiffany decides to go with John. Tiffany gets in the car with John. And he drives So what? Tiffany, he pays Tiffany. They have sex. John brings Tiffany back and drops her back off. And the girls say, hey, Tiffany, how was it? He's like, he was all right. He was pretty decent. And he pulls up another week. And this time he says, hey, Candy. And Candy goes with him. And Candy is brought back. And so Candy and Tiffany both say the guy's pretty cool. One day he pulls up and Candy and Tiffany aren't there. Only Susan's standing there. He says, hey, Susan, how about it? Susan's like, well, Tiffany and Candy came back. She gets in the car, but now there's no witnesses. He drives away with her. He, he, he rapes and murders her, dumps her body in a field someplace, and drives off. Now, the problem is when the police go to investigate, they're like, who saw, who was the last person to see Susan? Tiffany and Candy say, oh, we, were all, we weren't with her. She was off by herself. Nobody saw and nobody saw Susan get into a car with the, John, the serial killer. There's no proof of that. Then they ask, ha, has any guy been around? And Tiffany and Candy both go, yeah, well, this is one John that both of us, you know, we did stuff with him. And he was real nice and brought us back. So they don't suspect him because they are still alive, right? But that's not how it works. So the serial killers know that they all they have to do is find a girl by herself once they got her in the vehicle, she's dead uh, or some other way that he gets her alone. Um, uh, so, and drugs, you know, drugs play a huge part in it because when a person becomes desperate for drugs, they will get in the car with anybody. They will. And so, yeah, the drug dealer could be also a serial killer um, or a serial killer could offer her drugs or, <laughs> or she could OD. We have no idea. And um, unless they, unless she pops up someday or a body pops up someday, we probably won't know. We just, we just won't. That's the way things work. Um, um, Michaela says a life is a life. It doesn't matter if you're a crack whore. That's true. Yes. But your life is something for you not to destroy. And when you start destroying your life, this, the, it, I'm, I'm just saying it puts you in a very dangerous position and it puts you in a situation where it's hard to recover from and to pretend that that didn't happen. Okay. To pretend that the person is not in the depths of that is just a lie. And so I'm, I, I, yeah, I don't believe in sugarcoating stuff. And this has been sugarcoated in all the documentaries. They just allude to this and allude to that. I'm like, no, it's very clear. She was a she was involved in prostitution and she was a drug addict. I mean, that puts you in a dangerous situation. So if you're going to investigate, if you're going to be an investigator or a profiler, sugarcoating things doesn't work. When you're doing, when you're trying to find out what happened, and I mean, if somebody killed her, they deserve to be ar captured, arrested, and prosecuted. If somebody killed her, she didn't, that's correct. Her life, her life should not be taken away from her. OK, by somebody else. She's going to kill herself off. I mean, I can't do much about that. <laughs> and neither can anybody else. If she's making bad choices to, to that put her in a situation where she's ODs on drugs. She's the one that made the bad choice. But if somebody else harmed her, if they're the ones that killed her, even if they were, if, even if she was prostituting, even if there were a John, being a prostitute doesn't mean you deserve to die. But it does put you in a very dangerous situation. It does. I mean, 
that's why women a lot of times will work in uh, massage parlors because it's a relatively protected place to work. Okay, they do that. That's why it's because they have rooms <laughs> and and they have a you know the the boss is there or the madam is there and they go into a room with the guy and rarely do you ever hear of anybody being killed in a massage bar. But if you go, if you're dancing or stripping and afterwards, cause you can't have, well, some clubs actually have places you can have sex and sort of back rooms there too. But if you're going off with some guy that's offering you money and you go out of the building with him to his car, to his room or to wherever, that's where the danger starts. That's where you get killed. It, it's not an un, it's, it's, it can be a very unsafe thing. And um, so, yeah, that's it's not a good thing to do. And also uh, the same is true with um, um, uh, escort services. Escorts are these days, people go on the internet and they, and they promote themselves and they go someplace and meet somebody for sex. And unless you've got that driver sitting outside, which is what you should do, you can get killed by that person, especially if they give phony information, but whatever reasons they, they you connect and then you don't come home. So there's been quite a few escorts who've been killed that way. So yes, nobody deserves to be killed, but you, if you put yourself in a dangerous position, you might get killed. And, and you know, I'm just, I'm just warning women and men, stay out of this stuff is this not it you know she had talent she she was a, a reasonably attractive woman in, in, in her day um she she was she, she obviously took the whole journalism course and she could write she had opportunities to do something else and she i'm sorry but she made very bad choices and it didn't end well for her regardless of what happened to her it didn't end well for her and i'm not going to back down on that because it's true it's just sad it's sad and true so um, oh, thank you, Lynn. That's why we truth lovers prefer you, Pat, over any profit seeking agenda driven documentaries. I appreciate that, Lynn. Uh, you know, I say, how can you know it's I'm, I'm not here just to, yeah, to make the money as fast as I can by doing whatever I can to put out a show, and that's what a lot of documentaries do. And I've worked, I say, I've worked for a number of of them and and i've been appalled by how they put things together and a lot of people don't understand that the producers of many documentaries are very young and don't really know much about stuff that they're doing shows about they just gather up information they they come to me and say pat what do you think and then they try to gather it up and throw it into a spot and it's hard sometimes you have to fight them and say no i'm not going to say that i'm not going to go there because that's just nonsense um, and I fought on some of these documentaries. I don't do them very often anymore because they're real questionable. <laughs> Most of them, it's, it, you know, when they should be better. Because, I mean, a real good a documentary is a good documentary. I just saw a good one. Somebody told me to watch this. Oh, can I remember the name of it? Oh, I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to do a show on this because oh, my, my phone's dead. <laughs> so I did see this document. And I'm going to tell you the name of it. Hold on just because I actually watched the whole thing and I was like, like really happy. <laughs> I really was. I enjoyed it. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm actually really enjoying this. It is called, it is called, and I'll do a show on it. Well, I gotta find it. Love and terror on the howling plains of nowhere. That's the name of it. Love and Terror on the Howling Plains of Nowhere. And it's and a guy wrote a book about this, this about himself and his life in America, traveling about, being an, being a, being an author. And uh, and this is a fellow, the story is in this little godforsaken little town. Um, and this, this guy comes to live there and he's a, a mathematician. He gets hired as a professor. And then one day he just goes to class, does his stuff. And this is like, he's only been there like three, four months. I can't remember all the details. I'm going to do that first show, but he, he leaves. And that evening I uh, disappears and they find him months later tied to a tree, um, uh, tied to a tree and burnt up in the middle of absolutely nowhere. <laughs> and they've ruled it a suicide. So it's a really interesting case, but the documentary 
was so interesting, so clever, so fun to watch. And yet they, when they came down to the actual death of this guy, just trying to determine people saying, is it suicide? Is it murder? It was really very fascinating and interesting as to trying to figure out what could possibly be. But I had to appreciate the way the documentary was done. It was done with class. I, I was really, so I'll do, I'll do a show on that. So God. <laughs> you know that place, <laughs> Sarah, God forsaken USA, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it had some, but had a lot of charm too. So it's like, it was like really in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so I'll do a whole, I'll, I'll do a show on that. Cause I thought it was, somebody just asked me to do it too. And I'm like, what is this? And then I got, got really interested in it. And I'm like, I got, this is, this is good. And, I, and so I bought his book too. So any, so I, I, I couldn't resist. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that's, oh, Love on the Spectrum. I just saw one of the shows on that uh, the other day. And I have to admit, I thought it was very, I only saw one, it was like in the middle of it or something. I don't know how I ran into it, but I, I did seem to enjoy it. So I have to, maybe I'll start the beginning. So that <laughs> it's, um oh, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a, do you, do you know that song? Oh, somebody said, Young, dumb, and broke. Do you know the song? Oh God, who, who, oh, who? I love that singer too. Hold on a second, Cassara. You and I are singer people. Young, dumb, and broke. I love that song. That's Khalid. Khalid. Ah, oh, he's got my heart. That guy has such good songs. He's such a talent. Khalid, absolutely adore him. <laughs> so is that who you were talking about, or I'm just making that up? Uh, <laughs> But I do love, I do love him. I think he's fantastic. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we're on, oh, I'm, I'm thinking it's drugs. Yeah. So we are on the same page on that. Okay. Not many people know Khalid. So I was surprised about that. <laughs> um, heard about which one? The, uh, the guy in the getting burned up by on a tree in the middle of nowhere <laughs> or this case. <laughs> okay. I got to stop. <laughs> so anyway, just a super sad case. and But as a profile, let me finish this up by just saying, I'm lacking all the police reports. Again, if I had access to police reports, if the family wanted me to look at those police reports and try to determine what actually happened, did she go to a phone booth? Did she not go to a phone booth? Or is her husband's ex-husband squirrely enough to kill her? Or her vampire boyfriend, is he squirrely enough to kill her? Um, are the sightings legitimate? Um, I, I don't know because I, I, I just don't have um, all the information. But I lean toward her leaving the home that day. And I lean toward the two guys who lived there not having anything to do with it. I lean toward that just because I can't come up with a good motive. Um, and I just find that, oh, they, they, that one guy kept saying, well, maybe the two guys are protecting each other. And I'm like, so let's say, let me think. So boyfriend says, oh, man, you killed my girlfriend. I'll protect you. <laughs> or, or the ex says, man, you killed the mother of my son, but I'll protect you. Does that make any sense? See, that's, that's just that's kind of nonsensical. So I can't believe the two of them are in it together. So the two of them having questionable stories. I don't know what the cause of that is. Are they whack jobs in their brains? Are they doing drugs themselves? Uh, is it just who? I don't know because I can't access the information to see where, what inconsistencies that we're talking about, and who who wrote these reports down. I can't see who wrote them, so I don't trust them. So it leaves me four documentaries later with with not enough information outside of the fact that nothing good happened to her. Let me put it that way. Either either she left and end up in a horrible life of homelessness and dementia, or she's been murdered, or she committed suicide, or she OD. I, I can't come up with anything better than that. Um, but again, I'm going to say I stand by. You know, when you have choices in life, this is not the way to go, because she had she had she had something going for her that she sort of basically threw away. That's all I can say. She threw it away and um, by making poor choices. And, you know, I, we have to be, we have to take responsibility for our own choices. And if we make bad choices, we got to try to unmake them, <laughs> you know, unmake them before they're permanent. We all make dumb choices when we're teens and in twenties. I mean, I, 
I've got some dumb choices I made. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> I made them. But luckily, I pulled back out of them. I said to myself, whoa, that's stupid. <laughs> Don't do that. And I stopped doing that. And I went on. I never did drugs or anything. So that was, for me, it was fortunate. Because drugs can be something that sets everything else in motion on the back. You know, um, I never did drugs. So thank God. Um, and I'm very, you no, know, I'm very anti-drugs. So because I see too many people lose their way once they get into drugs. So don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Um, um, oh, she had a son. He should have been her priority, not the lifestyle. Yeah. And, and the, they kept claiming that she did everything for her son, but that is just simply, I'm sorry, that's garbage. And it's not true. Uh, her son was not benefiting. He was living in a, he was living in a, creepy situation and, and a shithole without a phone, you know, with, with, with a mom who was running around uh, prostituting and doing drugs. I mean, that's not, a, that's not taking care of your son. That that's a lie. That's a simple lie. It's like your lifestyle was more important to you than your son. And that's a fact. And whether you thought you loved your son or not, you didn't, you didn't express it in the proper way. And she could have, because she had, education and talent she could have changed her life she could have even if it meant just working down down this down the, down the street at staples where they were doing the the, the the shopping there she could just go to work at staples and then work her way up from there but that's not what she chose to do <laughs> i love i always love that saying doctor it hurts when i do this doctor says so stop doing that <laughs> and it's true I mean, sometimes it's, it's not that simple, but it is that simple. That is that is true. Or she could have worked at the pizza parlor. She could have. Um, somebody did. Somebody who was not doing drugs and prostituting was working at the, uh, the pizza parlor. So, you know, some people want a quick way to um, money, uh, a quick way to excitement, a quick way to fame. And, and they choose to do things that don't get them there, that actually take them the opposite direction um, and journalism. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough, tough, tough field to go into, but you can, you can work in, in adjacent fields. Um, like you could work at a school, you could be teaching while you're doing your journalism. Sometimes you have to do two jobs, you know, one that makes you money and one that you're hoping one day you're going to write the great American novel. Um, but you're not going to write the great American novel or become a great journalist if you're prostituting and doing drugs takes up a lot of your time. The only reason she was able to write what she did was because she was already working in the field where she was doing the research. <laughs> you know, it was easy for her. What if she had to stop that and do a whole thing on something else? She wouldn't have been able to do it. So she, you know, and she did, you know, she had an opportunity here to be, you know, get something in print, which is tough, but she needed to expand from there and she never did. And she was already 36 years old. Doesn't mean you, you know, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't believe that any age keeps you from doing something. She could have quit everything right then and got herself cleaned up and gone into a healthy job, provided for her son um, in some healthy way. And, and then one day she might have gone back to journalism. And, she, you know, and, and it's a shame. It's, it's, it's a waste of a life. It really is. And I'm sure that also affected her son. And uh, somebody sent something to me and doesn't seem like he's doing real well as an adult. But uh, Joe says, I think it's possible one can feel empathy, but still recognize a person's failings. Yes. It's not about hating on someone. It's about identifying mistakes. Thank you, Joe. I mean, I think we spend too much time being so kind and so whatever that refuse to, refuse, we don't look at reality. But if you're going to be a detective or a profiler or try to analyze something, you cannot play a game of let's pretend, you know, let's pretend. No, it's like, let's pretend she wasn't involved in prostitution. Let's pretend. No, because because if you recognize that she was, then you know where to maybe look for where the problem is, where where she might have gotten killed. How are you going to investigate if you're going to say, well, I don't want to go there? <laughs> it's like, you know, um, you have to go wherever. So if somebody, if I end up dead on my floor, with a knife in my back, um, so we got to find out who I pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was something I said on this show. <laughs> maybe it's because I, you know, was unfair to somebody. Maybe it's because I picked 
really bad men to go, you know, mess around with them. One of them got me. I mean, whatever, you know, maybe you have to look at me, my own personality to see whether I'm involved in things that are dangerous or whether I was just a really unlucky. I mean, it's possible. Now, mind you, it's always possible that somebody who's in the worst situations, she could be a drug user, a prostitute, whatever. And she literally could be walking home from the, the phone booth and get grabbed by a serial killer who doesn't even know who the heck she is. <laughs> that is possible. You know, so sometimes it can be that no matter that your life has nothing to do with what happened to you. That is something just one of those completely freaky things where somebody just chooses to attack you, break into your house. They don't know who you are. And so your lifestyle has nothing to do with what happened to you. So you, you can always, you can, so even in this case, you have to accept that's possible. But I see too many people trying to play down everything except for the vampire and, and stuff, <laughs> whatever. Um, instead of saying, you know, she was in the last, and usually what happens right before somebody disappears or gets something happens to them. You look at exactly where they were and even her friends say she was she was spiraling down. You know, she was seemed weird. she seemed off. She said she was depressed. She said she was, you know, she the life had gotten gotten got, just was destroying her. She said all these things two weeks before she disappears, along with all the, along with all the um, uh, delusional stuff. And so now we're going to say we shouldn't look at that. We should pretend none of that is true. You can't do analysis like that, you know. So, and that's a fact. So, <laughs> what? Watch Pat's rape video on Williams. Williams. I'm trying to figure out who Williams is. But what show was that? I, I, you know, it's funny because people, I, you know, one of the things that'll happen, by the way, so I'll do a show like this and three years from now, somebody will say, so Pat, tell me about this. And I'm like, I don't even remember the show. I don't, I'm having trouble remembering the case, <laughs> you know, because I'm doing so many of them once I finish with it. A lot of times I, I, I'm not going to remember the details unless I go back and watch my entire video over again and go back through it all. So, but um, I'm not sure. Oh, Wendy Williams. <laughs> Wendy Williams. <laughs> See, I'm like, what case was that? Williams, Wendy Williams. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, mm, that's a whole nother story. Oh Lord. Um, <laughs> uh, but um Two days ago. See, I can't remember two days ago. <laughs> so I do a lot of crap. Um, hi, Sky Ricky. <laughs> nice to see you here. You're a little late, unless I missed you coming in. Um, you have to be as real, as factual as you can be. When you're doing this kind of thing, you know, it's a whole different thing if you're in, well, you know, even if, let's say you're doing therapy. You know, if you're a therapist, and somebody comes into you, you can't help them if you don't know the truth. If you're going to play a game uh, and they're going to present themselves as something they're not, you can't help them because obviously she had some real deep seated stuff that put her into a, a life like that. And um, to, but uh, to say to um, sugarcoat it, you know, if I were a therapist, that would not be the way to help her. I would just have to find out why you're, why have you chosen this life? Why do you want to stay in this life? What is, what, what's up with that? And I know sometimes the money can be good, but where's your money going to? Because you don't seem to have any. So, you know, and even if you do make good money and keep it, because some, some women get into prostitution and uh, they're rich. <laughs> you know, they do escort work um, or find sugar daddies. Uh, and they have beautiful condos and nice, nice clothing and all this kind of stuff. I still think it is damaging to the spirit and to, and to, I, I don't think it's a healthy lifestyle, just regardless. Um, and I think there's better lifestyles to live. But um, at least those people have money and she doesn't. So, or didn't. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that that is true. I'm telling you that, um, that there is a truth to that. Um, she didn't want minimum wage. It's very difficult. That's one of the lures. And this, again, is, is just reality. One of the lures of prostitution is the fact that women can make a lot of money way over what they can make. Being a being a whatever, being a, almost any any regular job, entry level type of job. And once you see the difference you could make, you know, it's like 
here I make, say, for a whole week, if you're making $10, $400 for a 40 hours. I spent 40 hours working for some, I was stuck there tw eight hours a day doing torturous work. I hated every moment of $400 or it took me two hours, <laughs> you know. And then you, the, the, the women weigh that out. So like, well, two hours of, oh, so what? I have sex with a guy. I've already had sex with other guys. I had sex for no money. You know, I just had a couple boyfriends and we all had sex. I wasn't that great anyway. So, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to have crappy sex with, with guys for no money, I might as well get paid to have crappy sex and I won't mind it so much. I'll make $400 and I won't have to work in that, that, that place. And that suckers, suckers people in, but it is, it is a profession, which is, becomes very, very, uh, you know, it's interesting. Some of the things uh, I have to say, the book is pretty grotesque, this red light book. Um, I don't know if I recommend it to anybody because it's, it's pretty gruesome. But there's things in here which are what they talk about with um, uh, what happens to the, the people in this business, um, what happens to their minds, what happens to their bodies, what what, you know, what it's 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 very sad. I mean, this it's it's not a pretty thing, you know. It it, it just isn't. It's it's not nice. Um, uh, and so making the making prostitution pornography which is another form of prostitution um any of these things pretty or the life pretty it is it's, that's just that's just wrong that's that no nobody should try to make that life pretty you know once upon a time um the reason people got into these professions was because they were starving you know it's women across the globe and men too uh who prostitute because they actually need food <laughs> literally need food for them and their children. They don't have any options. Um, and that's how they survive. There's a difference between prostitution for survival, which is very unpleasant and prostitution because you think it's a lifestyle that's going to benefit you, which it's not. It always has a detrimental uh, effect. So, and that's my, that's my little soapbox for today. Anyway. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go, let's see what else. I, okay. I'm, I'm past my two hour point now. So anyway, that's it for today. Um, I will see you guys for the um, uh, hangout during the week, uh, which will be on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I'm probably going to do a show on the thing I talked about. I'm also, somebody's asked me to do a show on the Vanishing Triangle of Ireland. So I'm going to be watching that um, that documentary on that and seeing, seeing what I come up with because I'm looking forward to finding out what this vanishing triangle is all about. Is it like the Bermuda Triangle or is it just some made up nonsense? <laughs> I don't know. So I've got lots of things to do. Oh, and I'm also going to do, um, I've got these requests and they're in a row and I'm, I'm studying all of them at the same time. So I'll get to them one at some point. So just hang in if you've asked for something or just harass me some more and we'll see which one I do next because, you know, can't get everything done right now um, or next week, but I, I will try to get to it at some point or get back to it. Okay. So thank you for being here, everyone. And, um, oh, aren't you nice, Lisa? <laughs> I love all my people in here. Well, except for a couple. No, <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> You're all great. <laughs> and you make it fun to do. So a good night, Sky Ricky. Or good after. When is it? We're still in the afternoon. So we'll go there. Pat ignores me. I would never do that, Michaela. You know, I adore you. <laughs> I get accused of all kinds of things here. Um, great dress. What dress are we talking about? Is that my, is that my young shot? Okay. I'm going to put my young shot up before I leave again. Yeah. I don't know if it's what you're, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about. Where's my, yeah, there I am. I'm 19 years old. I was wearing a, so, I remember this. It was like a satin dress with a little bow on it. You see, I've new, I never wore jewelry and um, I didn't have pierced ears or anything. So, but um, yes, that was 19 years old and, yeah, I don't know what that trip to New York was all about, but it didn't turn out well. I hope I had New York pizza and some decent bagels, you know, and some arugula while I was there, at least to get something out of being in New York. Uh, I have no memory of that whole trip. I just remember that one moment where we both went, let's get the hell out of here. Because <laughs> I wanted to live to see another day. Um, <laughs> Probably too late for me next Wednesday. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the show after that. So I there's a little issue here. So I'm going to do two seven o'clock shows in a row and then I'll be back to three o'clock. 
I do three and seven, three and seven. But last week I screwed something up and I have a, a, a daycare of my granddaughter issue on Wednesdays. So hmm. did I come back married, married and pregnant? I'm, are you talking to me? <laughs> I'm not sure you're talking to. <laughs> no, didn't, didn't do any of those things. Um, <laughs> it was only a one day trip. But anyway, yay, boxing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, see you the next day. It'll be not this week or next week. It'll be the one after. Sorry about that. I screwed something up. So I went I went off my normal schedule. Now I have to fix it. So anyway, so I will see whoever can make it on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And uh, thank you again for being here. And if you're new to the channel and are still hanging around, do like and subscribe so I can continue to do this stuff. Anyway, see you later, guys. Mm -hmm.